Good morning again, colleagues, and to everyone joining us from within the Caribbean region, and to those of you who are from outside our region and part of our global community. The Media Institute of the Caribbean welcomes you to our Climate Justice Journalistic Perspectives webinar series. We are on day two of our agenda, and this initiative is supported by Open Society Foundations, and we thank them sincerely for supporting and recognizing the significance of the topic and the important role of media and civil society groups in the effort to bring about more understanding and sensitization on the issue of climate justice. We are going to start this morning with a gentleman who some of you may have heard from on day one, Mr. Steve Maximi, and he is going to address the issue of dealing with the impact of climate change, the ability and capacity and the cost of adaptation. So without further ado, I introduce Steve. Steve? Good morning all and thanks so much, Karen. I am really, really pleased to be on this morning, on a morning that is dedicated to youth <clears throat> and history. I have been asked to, to open, to open this session, not because, and I'm, I'm gonna use a cricket reference now for those of you who come from cricket playing countries or countries where there's interest in cricket. And I know a couple of the panelists and the moderator are really keen cricketer, cricket aficionados. Given the task of opening, hasn't been you know, an easy one. And I'm not actually opening, I'm opening the second day, which tells you that I was the overnight watchman, you know, and um, I'm not really the, the key batsman, just have me opening today to get the second day rolling. I've been asked to, to talk about a particular topic and I'm going to share my screen with you now so that we can get cracking. Is everyone? Yes, we can see yes. it. Thank you. Right. Yeah. So, so I've been asked to talk about dealing with the impacts of climate change, ability, capacity, and the cost of adaptation. And uh, those of you who are accustomed to dealing with me would know that I love to rush through this phase of it. This is the information phase. And I'm a firm believer in the decover continuum. I think that this information that I'm going to share with you on the slides, you know, it's available everywhere, you know, I could, I could easily email this to you. Where I'm really interested in, in the interaction that will come when we have the question and answer session. So I'm gonna to try to get through these slides in about 20 minutes or less, and that will give us 20, 25 minutes to really have a conversation. So climate change impacts, and these are the consequences of climate change, the expected and, and or realized um, impact on natural and human systems. So I've, I've chosen six, to deal with this morning, just for us to have a conversation. So you're talking about some of the hydrometeorological ones like drought, floods, hurricanes, and there's sea level rise, pest and disease spread, which is an aspect that I, I find gets uh, underreported under a story that is not told as much. When we think about pest and disease spread, we're thinking about windborne spread, of course, but also we should bear in mind SARS related type zoonoses and a zoonose, as most of you would know, is a, a disease that can pass from animals to people. But some of these zoonoses have been more widespread because of habitat destruction. So that you've had more mingling and co-mingling with wild and domesticated species and so on that has had an impact on SARS type viruses, which are very topical nowadays, as you know. And there are heat waves, which, we need no further explanation. And then you have the warmer and more acidic seas and coral bleaching, two very significant impacts. And then, as I mentioned previously, loss of habitats. And these habitats are not just habitats in terms of um, our forest dwelling friends, but we're talking about loss of habitats as in human habitats as well. And when we did a uh, session with our colleagues in the, in the Pacific, you know, the, those, Islanders, big islanders living on atoll, uh, is to find themselves without a place, a place to live in the sense that they do not have a genuine habitat. So loss of habitat is a major one. So having just quickly outlined those six that I've chosen as climate change impacts, 
how are we supposed to be dealing with these climate change impacts? Bear in mind that this conversation is rooted around some sort of discussion on climate justice and the intergenerational impact, which is my keying up of the next session, the panel with the, with the young people, right? Of which I was, from which I was excluded by, uh, by the organizers of this event for some, for some unknown reason. Anyhow, so dealing with the impact of climate change, we have been addressing it in a manner, you know, that the UNFCCC approved, you know, starts off with adaptation. And this is where you're trying to increase society's capacity to cope with the changes in climate. And I hope that is quite clear. And I'll try to explain it a little, a little, a little more later on. Mitigation, which has to do with efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And when we get to talk about mitigation, we start to get into some of the conversations that have been going on for the last 20 something years in, in my own experience. And, and for, for Dr. Trust, maybe in a couple of years before that. Geoengineering or earth manipulation. And I stuck this in because as radical as it seems now, and it was even more radical when it, when it first came up in terms of deliberate interventions in the, in the earth, earth's um, climate system and so, it is becoming less fringe now in that the, given how slow we have been to get the adaptation and mitigation aspects right, that there are still concerns that we may be going in the geoengineering route in time to come, literally. And then there's the pursuit of additional knowledge and efforts to understand more completely this climate crisis. And I wanna focus on that as well. Again, as a segue, because that is my function this morning, as a segue to the real thing, the real deal, which is the panel that, that comes after me. Now, in terms of dealing with these impacts, I listed adaptation at the top, you know, um, in the previous slide for a particular reason, in that this is seen as the major way that we are going to be dealing with, with climate change impacts. And as I said, when we get into the actual conversation and the cross-questioning and so, we'll see why that has been so or why it has been implied that that is the major route. But in terms of what we can do as, I mean, as, as SIDS residents, you need to regulate to decrease vulnerability. Um, there has to be more planning and disaster recovery type uh, responses. We have to do more impact assessments of critical systems and resources. We need to do some more observations and monitoring. We need to relocate vulnerable populations. Now, these, these are listed as adaptation responses there. But um, when we talk a little later on, and we talk about the cost of adaptation you know, and ability and cap capacity, we'll see what are some of the inherent um, inconsistencies and where there's a tendency to lean towards less just, um, less just transitions. Efforts to minimize compounding stresses, the traditional ones like air pollution, so habitat destruction that I mentioned previously. All of these are seen as ways of dealing with the climate change impacts through what is generally um, called or put under the rubric of adaptation. When it comes to mitigation, a number of people have been, you know, rather reluctant, hesitant, I should say, to include mitigation under the rubric of, you know, how do we deal with climate change impacts now? I mean, if I'm, if I'm being flooded out now, if I have seawater, um, salt water intrusion into my aquifers, you know, I mean, mitigation is nice, of course, I want to reduce the amount of greenhouse gases and all that, but how is that going to help me today? Why should I be considering mitigation as part of how I am as a frontline combatant, as I mentioned, as I mentioned on Tuesday, how am I going to deal with this through mitigation? What I want is relief now. And if I go back to the analogy I used on Tuesday, I mean, while this horse is starving, I don't want to hear how green the grass is that is growing. I want to know what are we going to do today and now. But as I hope I will expand later on, mitigation is a means of dealing with, 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 our, with, with climate change impacts. And some of the things that we can do, when I say we know, speaking from the, from the front line, 
is to improve the regulations in terms of you know, how are we going to limit these emissions of, of greenhouse gases, the type of research and development that we can use to deploy new technologies. Of course, the new technologies are the more common ones that everybody would have heard about in the solar, solar power, wind power, et cetera, geothermal. How do you conserve energy and you conserve land as well? Because I'm, I'm sure, as I say, without getting into a climate change lecture, that you understand the impact, the mitigative impact of, of forestry and agroforestry and reforestation and, and the like. So how do you conserve energy and land as a means of mitigating? And then, there, of course, there are the efforts to increase public awareness of which this webinar series and most of the work that has been done by MIC and, and the Media Association of the Caribbean falls under that rubric as well. How are you going to put out positive in incentives to lower emissions? I mean, we would all have seen the celebrated cases of, of Barbados of this world where, you know, very, very early on, there was this really, really targeted, well-appointed impact in terms of how you're going to reduce electricity use and the use of solar water heaters, et cetera. How do you now add a cost for using up, using the atmosphere to dispose of greenhouse gases? And this is more punitive aspects now, again, within the whole rubric of, of climate justice, where you put a carbon tax or so and you penalize people. Um, this type of thing is retributive now in terms of how you charge people literally for polluting the, the atmospheric commons, if you like. Then there's the geoengineering, which as I said, I included for completeness, but I don't think I want to spend too much time on this now, only to say that some of the treatments that we considered radical before for, for diseases, I mean, you know, um, in the same way that we have considered some of these solutions and ways of dealing with climate change as being radical, I mean, reflecting sunlight on the outer space to offset greenhouse gas warming, you know, things like carbon removal and extraction of, of, of carbon dioxide from the air and sequestering it in, in abandoned, um, in abandoned uh, oil wells and so, all seem fairly radical at first. But if we, if we cast our minds to, other sectors and other types of crises. I mean, the idea of a cancer treatment that would involve literally going in there and killing cells by radiating it would not have been an easily arrived at decision. So that we have to keep at the back of our minds that given how we are progressing with this crisis, that there may be times when radical solutions as are being proposed, proposed through geoengineering may become you know, powerful, powerful course. And then there's the one that I'm particularly interested in on a morning like this when we are going into a youth panel. And this has to do with the pursuit of additional knowledge. And I want to read it. I know we can all read, but I want to read this one just for emphasis. So we're talking about the research, the observations, the scientific assessment, and the technology development that can increase understanding of the earth system, reveal risk or opportunities associated with the climate system, and support, this is the important part, support decision-making with respect to climate change. Now, again, I, I remind you that this is not only a conversation about how one deals with climate change, but it is within the context of climate justice. So, with that being said, let me just, as is my want, get the def definitions out of the way. So when I talk about ability and capacity, I'm talking about ability as the actual skill, whether it's a mental or physical skill, and when I say capacity, I'm talking about the potential to develop that skill. And my premise is that since these small island developing states and the low-lying coastal areas like, uh, like countries like Belize and, and Suriname and Guyana, all considered under the SID rubric, I am suggesting that they should ensure that the abilities of their citizens are banked, prioritized, employed, and remunerated. What do I mean by that? I mean, we need to have skills inventories in, 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 in our countries. Um, it is rather fortuitous that on this call this morning, on this panel and, and series this morning is Dr. Neville, Dr. Ulrich Trott, who is, I mean, you know, a virtual pioneer in this thing. And I'm sure he would allow me to tell tears out of school in that when the GCF funding first came about, you know, Neville approached me on a, 
couple of other colleagues and say, you know, you really need to be able to put together proposals to do this thing because he recognized that there was a level of expertise resident in the region that could tackle it. But we soon found out that, hey, you know, this, this is going to take more than just the ability that we have in here right now. I mean, as capable as some of the other people were, you know, don't judge the capabilities by on my level, right? We had people like Arlington Chesney and so on. But it became very, very, very clear to us that we needed to have some sort of capacity building aspect to these GCF applications, because as complicated as they seemed in the very beginning, you know, we have found out that you know you must find mechanisms to increase that capacity, the potential to develop that skill. So I'm saying that in SIS, every effort should be made to utilize the potential within their citizenry and uh, the readiness grants and some other aspects of GCF operations have been put in place, including the project, um, the project program facilitation unit, project preparation facilitation unit, and that those kinds of things. So I hope you have seen the progression in terms of where I'm going with disability and capacity. So those of you who who were on on Tuesday would know that I, I attempted to approach the climate justice milieu in four distinct ways. There was a distributive aspect to the climate justice and where you're determining who gets what. And I had proposed CSAC as and there. In terms of procedural, determining how fairly people are treated, we well to just transition on Tuesday. Retributive, in other words, the punishing aspect, you know, the common taxation, that was fair as well. And then there was a restorative, which has to do with restoring to rightness. And I pointed out on Tuesday, and those of you who, haven't, who weren't here, you, know, you could probably look at the recording and you'll see you know, just how I attempted to deal with that. But my perspective on all of this is that climate justice is about the mobilization of goods and services. You know? I mean, we could say it's, it's about funding and all that, but the funding is going to be used for goods and services. When a country accesses grant or other funding from an agency, a multilateral agency, or international agency, if you get a million dollars, you don't get that million dollars to just put it into the central bank and leave it there. You're going to be buying goods and services. And one of the, one of the telltale things about justice, especially climate justice, is that it must not only be done, it must be seen to be done. And when you find yourselves in situations where, again, to go back to analogy that I wouldn't have time to explain again, but like I mentioned on Tuesday, if there are people who dug the pit in the first place, now that I've fallen into it, I'm taking money that, I was, that was given to me, granted to me, because of some sort of justice in connotation, and I'm paying those same people who dug the pit in the beginning to show me how to come out of this pit. And I'm buying goods and services, especially professional and, and, um, and technical services from them. So they're, they're, they're literally double dipping in my, 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 my opinion. So I'm saying that in a case like that, justice is not being done. And it doesn't appear to be done because when I look back at the perpetrators as it were, it's, it's almost, I mean, without being crude, it's like taking somebody to court who slashed you, you know, in public. You know, you're walking down the road minding your own business. Somebody came up and slashed you, unprovoked. You go to court and you get, you win a settlement. And that settlement, you have to use that settlement to pay the guy who turns out to be a surgeon, you know, to, to stitch you back up. I mean, somehow, you know, something doesn't sit right with that. That, you know, that, yeah, when you think, you know, it's, it's, you, you're, you're getting your just desserts and then the same person who caused the problem is coming to help you fix it now. And then, of course, most, most importantly, and I'm exactly on the 20 minute mark, most importantly is that climate justice is an intergenerational issue, hence the upcoming panel. And folks, there ended the sermon, and I really want us now to get a chance to really interrogate this information because as those of you who know me well know that I believe in data, yes, I believe in information, 
But until that information is interrogated and becomes part of your knowledge platform, we have not done anything. I could have sent you these slides, you know, instead of you having to sit there and listen to me, blah, blah, blah about them. So I think this is the important session now where I get to take your questions and we interrogate the information. And especially with people like Dr. Trotz on key, you know, if there's anything or not, if I'm sure there are things that I would have said that would rock you to the board, to the, to the core, um, Neville, you know, please jump in now. Likewise with, with Wesley and, and Kiran. So let's roll. Thank you. Thanks very much, Steve. Um, so is, um, are there any questions? Is there anyone who wants to go first? Okay, Wesley, you're here. Yeah, yeah let me yeah, try Wesley and Neville. <laughs> okay. As the two, yeah. cricket, as two cricket fans. So, to read my um, overnight stand. The, I, I, I was very much interested in the, um, the point you made about the radical solutions, the possible mm -hmm. radical solutions, including geoengineering and so on. But um, you did not put this point in, in, in the same bracket, but um, you spoke about the relocation of populations. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I think that um, it might be instructive to point to instances um, where there have been actual relocations or attempted relocations or where relocation has is should is or should be up and center as as, a, as an action to be taken migration with dignity i think, exactly. I, 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 think I don't want to start i want to start there for the benefit of the the the, the, the participants wesley and i and, and kiran were lucky enough to be on this uh, conversation with, with our colleagues in the pacific in terms of how they are dealing with the climate change impacts and of course, sea level, I shouldn't say of course, but sea level rise was one of the most impactful ones. Because living in an atoll, you know, where your, your highest point might be in eight or nine feet above sea level, anything that smacks up sea level rise is going to mean that you're going to be dislocated and you have to be relocated. And there was a particular um, country, it was the, the name slips me now, Wesley, maybe you could help me, where the president actually has a plan in place. This is something that is already being funded where they can migrate with dignity. In other words, rather than have his entire population end up as climate refugees, which is not a, a new thing. Eh? I mean, there are in fact climate refugees out there, right? Where he has come up with a scheme where they're funding education and other types of activities so that when his population, his entire population has to move, when they do move and go to a mainland territory, whether it's New Zealand or Australia, wherever, they can migrate with dignity. In other words, you're not going to be migrating cap in hand on your border, you know, begging, please, 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 please still let us in. So, so thank you, thank, thank you, Wesley. And again, within the context of a climate justice discussion, you know, there's absolutely nothing just about that, all right? Um, you're asking people to make a transition, not from one form of energy use to another, but from one civilization to another. And I know it's a point that Wesley is particularly strong on about a Caribbean civilization and civilization in SIDS. When you ask an entire population, an entire civilization to just up stakes and move somewhere else, you are I mean you're losing a whole lot of cultural, anthropological, and a whole range of other big words like that in, in, in the process. So Wesley, I hope that started to answer some of your concerns, or if you want to redirect me. Yeah, no, and I think that also there have been instances of at, at least attempted internal migration. Um, yes. I know Dr. Yes. Trotz is in Belize. Oh, so. is in Belize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a reason why Belize City is no longer the capital I, of um, is no longer the capital of Belize. I don't know, Neville, you want to to chime in here? And and while you're on it, uh, I mean, you know, the after the hurricane season of 2017, I think it was when Barbuda was essentially depopulated. Mm -hmm. Those kinds of questions, even though things are, are starting to normalize now, but still the vulnerability exists. Yes, and not only that, they may be normalizing, but there have been reported in the regular press instances of you know, apparent land grabs, literally. Because um, as it was, was it Baron Rothschild, you know, who said in the 18th century, you know, the time to buy is when there's blood in the streets. 
you know, um, it, is a, it is a code that I have been using here with our agricultural sector to tell them, you know, when, when you have blood in issue, this is the time to buy and this is the time to, to drive home the point about the importance of agriculture and, and stuff like that. But uh, in, in a similar vein, I think we have to use these kinds of crises to show that if there's going to be any justice at all, especially climate justice, then if you have people forcibly, forcibly might be too short, but removed from where they are, just grounds of pure survival, then when time comes to repopulate, if you like, the island, then there should be very little room for the kind of purported speculation that I'm hearing about, especially under the rubric of solutions to buy investment and a whole range of other fancy sounding terms like that that I'm surely un unqualified to talk about. Yeah, Wesley? Um, yeah, also on the, on the point of adaptation, um, one of the, the, the points made in your slide on adaptation was a matter of regulation. What, what kind of regulatory framework is put in place to ensure that those measures that are, that are adequate to adaptil, adaptil, adaptability hmm. are in place. And I think that for Land journalists- Land donning is the first one. I mean, some, no, was, some, yeah. sometimes we don't keep an eye on these things as news stories. Ah, until yeah. something happens. So, you know, you have a whole land ownership or land tenure issue in, in, in Trinidad and Tobago and other countries. Um, yep. Maybe you want to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, as I said, without necessarily getting into specific examples, I think each of the journalists here will know what applies to their own country. But I mean, there are things like setback regulations that, that are not being enforced. <laughs> I remember, you know, many lifetimes ago, I was a Green Globe consultant and I was speaking to some hoteliers in Barbados and we were talking about the setback regulations, the usual 22 chain or how many other chains it was. This is from your time, Wesley, you would know about chains and, uh, and those, those um, imperialistic units of measure. But there was this whole business about the setback regulations for you know, the placement of properties. And some of the hoteliers were telling me, you know, this is a mere 20, 22 years ago, eh? Oh, our guests want to be able to just, you know, come from their rooms into the water. And I made the usual good more prediction of most trainees. I told them, I said, there will come a time when the, the visitor, the tourist, won't have to come out of the room and you know, just step off of their bed and they go to, in the water. Already. And I mean, unfortunately, you know, when you look at what's happening at Acre Beach and so, you realize that that kind of thing has come to pass. If we fail to, you know, maintain those regulations, if we fail to stick to ascribed mangrove areas. I mean, even in the absence of marine protected areas, there are some genuinely common sense type things, you know, that, that seem to go awry in, in this part of the world and another part of the world as well. But for our purposes in this part of the world where uh, things like mangrove regulations, dealing with mangroves and so are concerned. But as we are the adaptation point, Wesley, let me just say something about mitigation. I know there have been people, you know, highly placed people as well, say that, you know, don't tell me about mitigation right now, you know. I'm about to dead, you know. I am, one, I am too interested, you know, how much greenhouse gases we put in and we take out next year or year after that. A lot of us may not be around to do that, but I'm saying that there are some mitigative actions that can have, um, very, very useful implications right, 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 right now. Let me, let me take a, a case of a solar powered desalination plant, right? Of course, you can get that funded under mitigation in the sense that, okay, we are no longer going to be using um, fossil fuels to power this water pumping or water desalination um, process. So then you can get to use that now at a place like, let's say, Potworks in, um, in Antigua, which the threat of salt water intrusion in Antigua, I mean, it's, it's, it's alive and well, right? So that we, we already know that, okay, your freshwater lens is sitting on a, on a whole lot of salt water. Um, what is to stop us from not having to desal any water that's all that you take from, from Potworks, right? And I know that the late, um, the late chairman of the UP, UK, and, Chica Public Works and Public Utilities, uh, Rodriguez, you know, we had that conversation. 
you know, that there's going to be a time when just the provision of what should have been groundwater would have to be a desalination um, process. So I, I hope that I have shed a little light on that, Wesley. Because yep, I, you I, I use you as the um, as the as the bar machine for that. You know, if, if you yeah. could, Lord knows. You know. <laughs> Else. Okay. Now we have a question from Laura, Laura, who is in, in Mexico, mm -hmm. and she's interested to know what infrastructure projects are either being constructed or in the planning process as protection to hurricanes or other effects of climate change. Are there international investments in this area? And I think that's a very good tip. Very, very good. When we get to when we get when we sort of boil all of this down into actual stories, it's a very good journalistic question to ask. Okay, and now I, I will say something that I know that Linda will be, probably be able to take me up on. Uh, Linda Stricker is a, a journalist based here in Greater, where I happen to have to live now. There are housing schemes, and I have been on record promoting um, housing schemes that I have no you know, financial connection with. But I mean, if you think of some of the construction that went on in Kuvuri, let's say in Barbados, or as, as I'm finding out here now at Arisa, um, Arisa residences here in Grenada, where you have in fact constructed homes that are, you know, as hurricane resistant as, as, as one, one can imagine. No eaves, you know, full protection for the roof, that type of thing. Um, lots of mitigative and adaptative um, considerations. So or without, or without going you know, all around the bush, there are physical things that have been done, including burying of utility, of utility pools and connections and that type of thing. So that in, in the event of a, of a hurricane, you know, there are no electricity pools to be, to be blown over. I mean, um, you know, all your utilities are on the ground. There are physical structures in place in terms of infrastructure for not just conservation, because a number of homes are being built now, a la Anguilla and Karakou, where the foundation is really assistant because we are anticipating the type of drought, which was the first hydrometeorological impact I listed, drought to have a, a significant effect. So that if you do not have collection of water off your roof and so you know you're really good, it might be in some difficulty the way the, the climate models are, are leading us. So yes, there are in, in fact cases of, you know, of physical infrastructural type things, you know, similar to the type of beach defenses that you would see for, you know, for, for the seawall and for, you know, and for a whole range of other um, climate change impacts like sea level rise, you know, that, that, have been, that have been instituted. And these are some of the less green solutions. Um, some of the green solutions have to do with um, the use of plants, vetiver, and so for you know for riverine protection, um, for slope maintenance in overpasses, and so instead of having concrete all the way around your overpass, there are no ways of actually planting um, you know the, the appropriate types of grasses. That will hold the soil together, you know, and sometimes much more efficiently than than the built than using the built environment of uh, of, of concrete and uh, and or asphalt, you know, if you, if you can afford it. We we have um Arthur Bonham from you know that I, I, so as I'm concerned, I was well, well um, um attended to um Arthur Bonham Bonham who's talking about the um the role of behavior change. I don't know if I got that correctly, Arthur. Um, you know, I know that you did mention this as, as part of the in your but how significant is behavior change and through via public awareness? Yeah, well, there, there are two approaches to that, as I mean, as, as we commonly understood, there'll be the carrot and there'll be the stick. You know, the stick will be the, the, the taxes and the, and the imposed duties and so, you know, um, you, you see mild versions of it now with, 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 you know, the price of gasoline and so. Um, you know, so that would be one way of, you know, of um, nudging people in the right direction. And then there are the incentives, you know, the removal of import duties on, um, on electric cars, let's say, you know, or, or the removal of sales taxes or stamp duties. I mean, there are, there are a whole lot of creative ways, but as I said, they all fall under the same, well, to me, same two categories, either carrot or stick. 
you know, are they going to beat sense into them? Via the public awareness as well, eh? I'm not suggesting that you know, it is going to be something done in the dark on the cover of night, but you can have a, a public awareness campaign that suggests, watch yourself, this is what is coming. You know, this, this big stick is coming. You know, I'm just using the, the government information service and all the other, you know, state apparatus to let you know that, hey, you know, I think we should be going down this particular path. And this is the stick I have well kept behind my back but if you don't comply. Or you come with a character and say, look, you know, the government has announced these new plans for the importation of uh, electric buses, cars, um, um, Remove of stamp duty and import duties on, on solar water heaters, solar panels, photovoltaics, you know, the whole, the whole long range. So sorry to be so long-winded. Um, what's the question from again? Yeah, that, that, that's from um, Arthur from Haiti. Now, yeah. um, he's raising another point here. I, I don't know if I have my interpretation right, but he's talking about the, the ability to, to create a groundswell of public opinion mm -hmm. and activism that would mm -hmm. drive governments to take the, the appropriate action. But I want to add to that, that, okay, that's that's very good advice when it comes to general environmental management issues. But what we often don't see, and I think that there's quite a lot of activism on the ground, and we have Zico and others who could talk about that. Mm -hmm. But what appears to be absent with respect to this whole question of climate justice and making this transition from where we are to where we ought to be, is that there's no particularly strong um, body of public opinion that's driving government policy vis-a-vis -vis our international posture on these issues, such that we get a fair deal out of what is being proposed at the international level. Ah, well, I wouldn't want to, to cast aspirations on the, on the abilities or proven successes of our negotiators, but let me just, put it into a particular context based on the, on the slides that I may have, would have presented before. I still feel that we can do a lot more in terms of how this justice is done, you know, and how it's seen to be done. I, as again, not telling tears out of school, and I mean, a, a Neville is on the, is on the, is on the panel, so you can verify what I'm saying. I was recently part of a, of a large European firm's bid, successful bid, to conduct vulnerability studies in the, well, in a, in a part of the Caribbean. I won't get into specifics, right? Very, very, very big contract, massive contract. But when you see the terms of reference put out by the government, they're asking you stuff like this, um, which is the inherent, the inherent opposite of affirmative action. Eh? The, the, the bidding company should have done projects valued at, you know, $6 million before. <laughs> so poor me with my little, you know, two by four company. Don't get into consideration about the, my expertise, eh? but my little two by four company, I would not have had that type of catch 22 attached before, then I couldn't apply, right? But I was, I was obviously able to make the cut to be part of the, of the Spanish company the foreign companies bid that, you know, because they would have under their belt 12, $6 million projects. Am I, am I, am I, am I making sense, Wesley? Yes, understood. Yes. As, as part of our negotiation, we've been looking for that. There was a slide I had about, you know, what SID should be doing and they should be actively seeking, you know, ways of providing the goods and services themselves. And that's where the whole talk about intellectual property must came up on, on Tuesday in that we are designing systems here. We have things in place. We have ability. And with a little capacity development, we can be administering the stitches ourselves, having been slashed by the same people who are coming to stitch us up now. In your own ways. I hope I've mixed, mixed the metaphors there. <laughs> No, 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 you're, you're answering um, Christine Samwaru's question. She's from Guyana. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think in your own way, you're answering that question because she's asking about the role of indigenous people and, and, um, and, 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 and um, traditional wisdom. What, what, uh -huh. play, what role do they play in climate justice? And you raise the IPSU, which is- Oh yeah, the traditional knowledge is a serious IPSU. I mean, let me just see if I can take a, an example out of the wind, really. Um, 
there has been a lot of talk about, uh, well, not a lot of talk, but there have been rulings on, let's say, things like basmati rice. Uh, for those of you who are not into the whole intellectual property thing, there are, the, uh, aspects of intellectual property that deal with things like geographical indications where you get to you get to brand literally brand your product based on where it is produced and the, the simplest example of that is champagne you can't call your sparkling wine a champagne champagne sorry unless the grapes are grown in the champagne valley in fact it's, it's, it's as simple and straightforward as that so it takes something like basmati rice if as part of our adaptation to climate change impacts let us assume basmati rice Pick up another more local regional example. There's Maruga Hill rice in Trinidad now, right? If we are saying that, look, the way to adapt to this, the drought conditions that we're anticipating would be to plant more of uh, a rice that can stand up to those drought conditions. If you did not have proper ownership of that germplasm, or, or, the, or the planting material. You can find yourself in a lot of difficulty. If, let us assume, instead of Maruga Hill right, Maruga Hill rice, it was Basmati rice, then you have to pay a premium for it because Basmati as a brand, as a geographical indication, could only be obtained from a particular part of the world. And this is not something that you could do locally. And coming back to the indigenous aspect, I mean, I'm fortunate in that I've worked in Guyana, in the Tri Lakes area, and when you see what the Wayaka, you know, which is one of nine, nine indigenous groups in Ghana, what you see, what the Wayaka have done with, um, let's say, organic pineapples out of, out of Main State, you know, there are in fact several, several opportunities where, as part of the adaptation and mitigation, you know, it is really pushing us in the direction of something that indigenous people were doing all the time, anyhow. You know, so we get to reinvent the wheel with them. You know, they are busy going along their business, you know, using their quakes, you know, having very, 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 very minuscule carbon footprints. And they are busy going with their quakes, you know, and producing in mainstay and, you know, merrily going about the business. Kapui, same thing. You know, you've had, you've had entire communities in Kapui, off Lake Kapui, that have been using um, community owned. Um, solar solar power, you know, for their for their for their lighting and, and other power needs. So I'm agreeing. Steve, that, yes, you know, we should. Sorry. No, we have to start wrapping. But um, oh, I, I saw that the trucks turned his camera on, which means yeah. that he has a contribution. I think, I think he heard. I think he heard Guyana, and he just thought that you know, <laughs> you know especially he, with indigenous knowledge. Uh, yeah. Just a, an example of my experience years ago when my research interest was medicinal plants, we did a survey on use of biodiversity in a couple of Am Amerindian villages. Mm -hmm. uh, the results that I got weren't uh, particularly spectacular because all the plants that they talked about, we knew about. But years after, when I started climate change, I revisited that study. And we found that between two villages, and I and Surama, very close together, they had this, they had identified 27 different varieties of cassava and about 15 different varieties of maize. And then you look at the conversation that they had with the women, and they were saying, Oh, during the drought, we planned that. After yeah. flood, we planned that. So they have been manipulating this germ plasma over the years to deal with different climatic conditions. I've been trying like hell to get a project to more, more or less develop community gardens for in situ sort of conservation of that germplasm. And well, basically to go further than that, to develop protocols whereby anybody who's going to access that germplasm, especially the international, uh, uh, the international people to deal with, with uh, uh, cons conservation to stamp the ownership of those communities. Okay. Well, well, um, now, no, no, sorry. We don't we don't eat slice too much into the, the, the oh, panel yes, yes. Because oh, sorry, some sorry. of these yes yeah, so, some of these issues can and will be addressed by by the folks coming up because traditional wisdom um does not 
end at a particular point. It goes into intergenerationally to, to, the, to, the, to the newcomers to the scene. And I, so I'm sure that when Freeman comes in with his panel, yep. that this is one of the things that they will explore. But we, uh, we don't want to eat too much into their time. Wesley, do I have a minute? Just to sure. say that uh, my excitement about uh, participating in this panel is simply to address an issue that was raised a short while ago. This is about how do we get a groundswell of public sort of discourse and advocacy for climate change. And I think you in the media have a very important part to play to insinuate this issue into the discussion in the Caribbean. Uh, so as I say, this is one reason I was very excited to be part of this panel, because an informed media can be a tremendous force as we try to build that base throughout the Caribbean, calling for action and taking action. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Kiran. Oh. Yeah, th thank you so much, Dr. Trotz. And you know what you said is so true. And this is actually the first efforts of a kind in the region that we are doing this, you know, um, for journalists regionally. And it is such an urgent topic. And um, I hope that it really will spur the thought process for us to keep it on the front burner, because this is really about the survival of our people. If you wanted to look at that and <clears throat> look at it another way. And so we need to um, remember that. We're moving, sorry, we're moving into our next session now. It's a panel discussion on the intergenerational impacts of climate change. This is one of the sessions that I personally really, really wanted to ensure we included and be here for. And don't worry about Steve's sly remark about, about you know, not being included. The intergenerational has the, the um, tenets of youth attached to it. But um, all fun aside, we're going to have this session moderated by a friend and a colleague, Mr. Freeman Rogers of the BBI Beacon. And he will have with him Mr. Zico Kose, Communications Officer of the Cropper Foundation, and Ms. Simone Ganpat, Environmental Scientist. So I'm going to hand over now to Freeman. Freeman, are you with us? Uh, yes, I am. Thank you very much. Um, hello, good morning, everybody, and uh, MIC, thanks for having us. It's always great to be part of these cross-border discussions, which I think are really important and helpful, I know, for me as a journalist. Um, today for this panel, Simone and Zico each have a presentation for us, and we'll follow that with a Q&A session and discussion. Uh, but before we start, you need to know that this panel is interactive from the beginning because of a request from Wesley who has asked us to generate some story ideas out of it. So as we're talking, please be thinking about any ideas for articles coming out of these topics that, that are being discussed. When you think of one, you can just post a sentence or two in the chat. Uh, it doesn't need to be a fully formed idea, just anything really that comes to mind. We've got a lot of smart people in the room and journalists and, and others alike, and we just wanna brainstorm. I think Steve actually gave us a good start for that. Um, also feel free to post any questions as they come to you in the chat and we'll scroll through them at the end. Um, the topic of course is intergenerational impacts of climate change. Um, so as our science expert, Simone will start by explaining more about these intergenerational impacts and she'll give us some examples of adaptation measures that work and others that work less well or that don't work at all. I'm hoping she'll also give us a bit of feedback on, on stories that she thinks might be uh, good to write or that might be falling through the cracks or that could be covered better. Um, and then from there, Zico will tell us about some of his work as a communications professional in Trinidad and his experience reporting on COP26. And this is a somewhat unusual perspective because Zico actually went to Glasgow for COP26. And as, as you probably know, not too many Caribbean journalists managed to attend these COP meetings, even though you know, our region is one of the most affected by the decisions that are, that are made there. So should be interesting. And with that, I will hand the mic over to Simone. 
Good morning, everyone from Trinidad and Tobago. Um, thanks um, to everyone who took the time to join today. So I um I have a short presentation. So I will um I'll share my screen. You guys, let me know if you are uh, everyone is seeing my screen. Yes, we're seeing it, Simone. Lovely. I do. Okay. Yes. Oh, yes, we have. Nice. So, uh, as we said, the topic is the in intergenerational impacts of climate change. So it's been said in the first um, day of, of the workshop, it will be said again, but it could never be understated, uh, overstated that climate change is a human rights issue, right? And that's simply because we as humans depend on climate for every aspect of our lives. Now, the concept of climate justice originated in the global south uh, of which we are part, and it's built upon the reality that the groups that are hardest hit by climate change are the same ones that bear little to no responsibility for it. And of course, we think of ourselves in the Caribbean as, as well as other small island states, but it also extends to um, women, indigenous people, and future generations. And the movement really seeks to hold the wealthy nations accountable for the damage done and the current and future risks to the most vulnerable and affected regions. And intergenerational equity is a key part of climate justice. And it's evident in the number of young people that we see stepping up, stepping out and demanding change and justice. Um, climate justice. Now, climate justice, intergenerational equity, and sustainable development are all uh, intertwined. They cannot have one without the other. And these bits of legislation are evidence of that. Um, the first is a very popular one. It's from the Rio Declaration, also known as the Earth Summit, which was um, held in 1992. And it states that the right to development must be fulfilled so as to equitably meet developmental and environmental needs of present and future generations. The second is from the UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is also in 1992. And again, it says, and this is very important, this speaks to, as we know, climate change. If the parties should protect the climate system for the benefits of present and future generations of humankind on the basis of equity and in accordance with their common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. The last one is from the Brundtland Commission, also known as the World Commission on Environment and Development. And this one says, this is the, um, a very well accepted definition of sustainable development. And it goes development that meets, meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So we see that climate justice, sustainable development and intergenerational equity are all one and the same. And it's good to know that, um, and good to point out especially that climate justice, intergenerational justice had has made its way to the courts. And I'm just gonna um, show you just a few examples. The first one is a landmark case, the first of its kind where citizens in the state of the ne Netherlands, represented by agenda, they established that their government had a legal duty to combat climate change. And here's what happened. The Dutch government agreed to, to um, reducing climate emissions, greenhouse gas emissions by 20%. The people said that's not enough. They said we want it to be 25%. And the district, it was first um, brought up in the district of Hague and they ruled that the government must cut it. Of course, the government appealed and it went straight up to the Supreme Court. And this was in, this started in 2015 and ended in 2019 and Agenda actually won um, this case. The second one is a contemporary Caribbean example. And this is 
um, Thomas and the Freitas versus the state of Guyana, and this was actually in May 2021, and two Guyanese citizens argued that the government violated their constitutional rights and the constitutional rights of future generations by allowing oil exploration licenses to Exxon Mobil and other oil companies. Um, this case was adjourned to June of this year, so that is something to look out for. Uh, the climate litigation platform for Latin America and the Caribbean is a Spanish hosted, it's hosted in Spanish. And it's a platform, uh, a database for um, climate change lit litigation in the Latin America and Caribbean region. And last but not least, and I'm sure that some of us know about this, if you're um, from Antigua and Barbuda, you should know about it. But the last one is the Commission of Small Island States on Climate Change and International Law, which was um, signed in at the end of COP26 last year um, by the Antigua and Barbuda government and the Tuvalu government. And it was brought up as a way to address, legally address loss and damage to small island states by climate change. And all small island states who have an interest in addressing this are welcome to join the, um, the commission. And we're yet to see some more, um, some more governments take up that matter. So zooming right back into the Caribbean, and I'm going to, um, I must say that I am a little biased about biodiversity because this is where my specialization lies. So I just wanted to bring it into context. Now we in the Caribbean are inextricably, without a doubt, attached to the natural resources on our islands, right? And the, and the natural resources are, the, the biodiversity that we have on our islands are shaped by the climate, first and foremost. The climate, the location, the size of the islands. And the ecosystem services provided by, these, by this biodiversity, this host of biodiversity, as we call the Caribbean Islands biodiversity hotspots, are what we rely on for everyday functioning, supporting habitats, supporting cultural enrichment, supporting food, water, fuel, timber, and supporting um, regulating services, right? So what does that have to do with the Caribbean climate change context? If we, if we look at our, um, the state of biodiversity today, we could, it's clear that climate change threatens these ecosystem services that we have in the Caribbean. And the first photo, the photo arm, the photo here and the first headline are a clear example of the intergenerational impacts felt in the Caribbean. Now generations before me could have told me about all the, all the mangrove forests um, along the stretches of the Northwest coast all along Port of Spain all on that side. I don't know anything about that. The last time that I saw mangroves down in the back there was when they were clearing it to build movie town, right? So we do, um, all of us probably have this type of experience in the Caribbean. And, um, and that's the Caribbean that's the Caribbean climate change context. We know of the importance of the mangroves in the Caribbean, but in the pursuit of economic development, we've made ourselves more vulnerable to climate change. The Caribbean, Caribbean countries are already at risk of climate change and, just, and this is just compounded by socioeconomic factors, political factors, cultural factors, geographic factors. And I want to point out this quote at the bottom here. And this is from Dr. James Fletcher that um, I presented in the first day of the workshop. And it says, countries in the Caribbean are being forced to borrow money to respond to a problem that it did not cause. In fact, respond to a problem where they are the victims, right? And, and that's one of the um, as one of the factors that exacerbates the effect of climate change in the Caribbean, high debt. And in addition to this, we have low, low 
um, awareness of climate change, reliance on exports and the global market, limited resource availability due to our small sizes, uh, slow accumulation of data to inform climate change effects. So all of these things make up the current Caribbean climate change context and what we could imagine for the future Caribbean inhabitants. So what is in store for future generations? Now, this is a very negative outlook, but I just want to point this out. And this is what will happen if we don't take action or if we don't realize what we're doing now and what needs to be fixed, what we can do better. Migration, and migration could be internal, it could be external, it could be forced, it could be voluntary. And um, Steve and Wesley were talking about it earlier. Um, I'll, give, I'll give an example of external migration and forced migration, although I don't really want to call this external. But let's, for the sake of it, it's external, right? Antigua and Barbados is same nation, but two islands. And the entire population of Barbados had to move to Antigua because Barbuda was considered uninhabitable, right? And that is that is a very negative implication that has a whole range of other um, effects. And these effects are yet to be reported on. So um, think about the social, the social implications, psychological implications, economic implications, developmental implications. All of these are yet to be reported on. So looking forward to hearing about those um, investigations. Uh, increased health issues due to warming temperatures, increased vector more diseases, loss of livelihoods, supply chain disruption, which goes hand in hand with worsened food insecurity, higher cost of living, loss of cultural identity, which is linked to migration, increased social and political instability, and increased difficulty for marginalized groups, such as women, to adapt. Now, the Caribbean people and governments have been very diverse and proactive in the way that they have chosen to deal with the effects of climate change, or as we like to say, becoming more climate resilient. So for the um, sake of time, I'll only cover a few, but these are some of the some of the things that I have um, noted as the features of Caribbean adaptation and mitigation. So let's talk a little bit about projects, programs, and policy. Those, this is like uh, as a as an environmentalist, this is something that um, I hear about a lot. There's always some project going on. Um, whether it's a small grant or a very large multilateral or bilateral project, but it's a very um, prevalent and continuous um, activity in the Caribbean region. And I have numerous examples of climate change projects. Um, back in the day, when I was not um, when I was not involved in this at all, probably um, writing in my school book somewhere, there's the special program on adaptation to climate change, the Caribbean Risk Management Project, the Adaptation to Climate Change in the Caribbean Project, and um, a more contemporary one would be the, the US Agency for International Development Caribbean Climate Change Adaptation Program, um, which was in 2016. And they all sound the same, right? And this is one of the, um, one of the questions we have to ask, uh, you know, what what is the how how long does it take to get from point A to point B? It's often a long time from the actual situation to the desired situation. Sometimes we never even reach the desired situation, right? Um, sustainability is often a gray area, and there's no um, mechanism in place to ensure that the project is sustained over time. Whose responsibility is that? Is that the government's responsibility? Is it, is it the um, implementing agency's responsibility? Is it the grantee's responsibility? So that is something that is very crucial, but 
often not um, given enough focus. Projects have also um, fit into this <laughs> fit. This one, given this one size fits all type of um, understanding, it, it, it's not necessarily the most appropriate to the situation. And one may give an example of nationally determined contribution. You may, somebody may wonder why it is as countries, Caribbean countries um, that cumulatively make up less than 1% of total greenhouse gas emissions. Why do we have to try to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by whatever um, determined time? Why can't we focus some more on loss and damage support or some other more pressing matter? However, um, the good thing about projects is that some of them are successful and they can be implemented in a local context based on their success in other islands. I'll give an example of this and this is actually not a project, it is a policy. And I don't wanna say, um, I don't want to say, I don't wanna speak on the success of it too, too much. Um, but I would give the example of the environmental and climate adaptation levy in Fiji. And basically what it is, it's tax on prescribed services in, um, in the, on the island of Fiji and businesses that have a gross uh, turnover of over $3 million um, uh, have to prescribe to this tax and the eligible businesses would be like hotels, restaurants, tourist vessels, homestays, aircraft, rental cars, etc. And it's interesting to think that um, how this could be applied to the Caribbean context. And this, these funds are um, theorized to go to go directly into adaptation to climate change. The second one is ecosystem-based adaptation. And this is an increasingly popular adaptation mechanism um, in the Caribbean. It's mostly implemented by NGOs. Um, and I'm sure we could think about a few examples, traditionally focus on marine and coastal ecosystems. In Trinidad here we have um, I Am Movement, which is which has spearheaded the vetiver grass um, planting to combat coastal erosion. There's also Eric in Tobago, Environmental Research Institute of Charlottesville, which has um, spearheaded artificial reef planting and um, so on. You all can probably give me some more examples of of other ones happening all over the Caribbean. Um, Ecosystem-based adaptation is, has been proven to be strengthened by community and indigenous knowledge, but it is very um, context specific, meaning that, and meaning that um, not all of these measures can withstand climate change. For example, in the Dominican Republic, there was an artificial reef built and it actually did not, it did not um, do much to help with coastal erosion. And even if we build artificial reefs and we, and we, um, we grow corals, are they likely to withstand the effects of ocean acidification? That's something that is, is um, unlikely, but still the focus is very much on marine and coastal ecosystems. And the science says that an approach that ties marine and coastal ecosystem approaches to forest and terrestrial ecosystem um, have a better chance of successfully adapting and mitigating climate change. Community-based adaptation is also a key feature of, of Caribbean climate change. It's usually integrated with ecosystem-based approaches. 
and it's actually thought to be in other parts of the world one of the most successful types of adaptation measures. However, there are limits to this. It usually requires external funding. It's it's very context specific and requires um uh heavy cooperation between community expert climate experts and government and there's also the aspect of sustainability that needs to be written in to ensure that these adaptation measures are sustainable and can continue to provide um, benefits for future generations this um this photo i chose this photo specifically i'm a little biased this is actually in trinidad and tobago and this is um some a community garden done by the sunbeam foundation of which i'm an advisor and um this is an excellent program however it would have slowed down due to covid and also at one point run out of funds um which just goes to show the issues that that community-based adaptation has and also what could be what could be buffered buffered and done better. Hard protection is a very, very popular adaptation measure in the Caribbean. So we're talking about seawalls. It's everybody wants to build a seawall. We've seen it all over the Caribbean. This photo is actually from the Bahamas where seawalls have been built over and over and over. And if you're from the Bahamas, I hope you can share some perspective on this afterwards. Um, and this is actually a photo of seawall that has, I think it was broken down and built again. And this is um, the issues with seawalls and hard protection measures are they're temporary and they usually shift the issue of coastal erosion and inundation in low areas along other parts of the coastline. Now there's also accommodation and advance, which is um, raising and retreating. And although this is, um, this does, this is um, apparent in some parts of the Caribbean, for example, Puerto Rico, and I believe Bahamas and on coastal, in coastal areas, um, it is understudied by scientists and needs more data to understand its effectiveness as an adaptation strategy. So migration actually wasn't on the list, um, but I just wanted to touch a little bit on it because it is um, something that is becoming more and more important to speak about, especially in the context of the Caribbean. Um, in the Caribbean so far, well, I just heard um, I just heard the example of Belize, but um, which is very interesting, um, but it's usually a last resort option and the outcomes are very context specific, meaning that there needs to be a social um, and developmental cultural buffer in place to ensure that the people who are moved, regardless of whether it's forced or planned can adapt uh, effectively and also are reduced to the economic um, and developmental risks when they move. And this is not always the case. And therefore you, you could think of migration as an impact rather than an adaptation strategy. However, um, as the conversation was going on, just as the conversation was going on before talking about, um, I think it, would be, it was actually the island of Kiribati in the Pacific Ocean. Planned migration and appropriate policies that include um, the thoughts of um, the strategies to, to buffer risks to to migrating populations could support the adaptiveness of, of, of migration as a strategy. So what did we miss talking about? Simone, Simone sorry, sorry to interrupt because this is fantastic, but we're running a little short on time, I think. Oh, no so worries, no worries. My, my second to last slide, don't worry. <laughs> oh, thank you. 
All right, thanks. So what are we must talking about? Firstly, um, climate change related health, mental health issues. Uh, anxiety is real, depression is real, and the youth are suffering from it. People don't uh, want to have kids, you know, and they're thinking about their future. Um, this is something that could be investigated um, from a journalistic perspective. Something good to, to, um, to look into. Loss and damage, we didn't talk about that enough. Uh, culture loss, biodiversity loss, public awareness and education, etc. The list goes on. Um, so what are the opportunities, the impacts, the lessons? We are all responsible for climate change, especially for the future generations. There's, in my opinion, at least more emphasis needed on loss and damage. Collaboration is important. I'm a scientist. Most of you are journalists. And I think that um, this is a very important platform for that link to be established. Young people must be a part of the conversation. And right now there are um, groups of young people, um, for example, Girls Care GA, uh, Caribbean Youth Environment Network, the Breadfruit Collective, that are making their voices heard and contributing to education and awareness on the rise. And last but not least, innovation and forward thinking is very necessary. Um, to ensure intergenerational equity and climate justice are achieved. And I want to leave you with this quote that I found was very interesting and very impactful. And um, it says, the most successful, successful climate change stories are those with human interests. You can give these stories impact by putting people in them because ultimately climate change is changing lives. And that's what readers and viewers relate to. And I, as a scientist, want to express this to journalists. I want to, I know about some of these things. I want to see you report it to the people. And that's about it. I'll hand it over to you, Freeman. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um... That was fantastic and packed with information. So we appreciate it. And we've got, we got great uh, story ideas already going in the chat. Um, and I was just looking to see if there's any questions, but maybe we'll address questions at the end after Zico goes. But just a, a couple story ideas that have popped up in the chat. Uh, Christine Samwaru suggests the role of colonialism uh, enslavement and indentureship on the current intergenerational harm that is brought on by climate change. Um, out of yours, Simone, uh, I'd suggested looking at successful climate lawsuits abroad and asking legal experts in the Caribbean if similar tactics could be used here um, to, to uh, given the, the legislative frameworks in place. Um, Simone, you, you gave us a whole long list of story ideas that I think you felt are undercovered, like social implications, psychological implications, migration, loss of livelihoods, and so on. Um, Rondell Smith, actually from here in BVI, our island of Anagata, asked, how do you combat or address a situation where a government is guilty of approving projects that exploit crucial ecosystems? which I think is another good story idea. Um, Soyini Gray said, uh, five years on, what is the state of the Caribbean recovery from the 2017 hurricanes? Which is a good question. A lot of uh, intergenerational impacts there. Um, and David Papana says, in Guyana, we have an example of what Rondell is asking about vast swaths of mangroves are being cleared to facilitate development of offshore storage facilities and wharf. <clears throat> Despite mangrove are protected by law, government has said that the development must take place and they will be replanting mangroves in other parts of the country to cushion removal for development. <clears throat> so another great story idea. We could look at all kinds of, uh, we could look at mangrove coverage and, and various islands. Um, oh, and I'd suggested from Simone's mention of seawalls, uh, we could look at seawalls in our country and see how they're being used or not being used. It sounds like uh, a lot of the time they might not be the best solutions. And I think if we all looked at that, that would be an interesting uh, uh, collaboration. And then some, Linda Straker suggested learning more about the link between mental health and climate change. 
can it be successfully argued that climate change is contributing to reduced population in some SIDS? So uh, great questions already. And we'll, we'll move on to, to Zico. And everyone feel free to keep, keep asking and keep, um, keep posting those. And we will come back to questions at the end if that's OK with, uh, that's okay with, with you guys. All right, and Zico, then over to you. Hi, everyone. Salut tout le monde. Uh, hola a todos. Uh, my name is Zico Cozy. Um, um, thank you once again to everyone for coming. And I, I hope that I'll be able to share um, with you some stories from my experiences that um, uh, reporting on climate justice that will mostly inspire, perhaps, and help to identify um, some of the consequences, I would say, of the lack of inclusion or lack of representation sometimes of youth perspectives, as well as help you maybe identify some opportunities that arise because of that for the type of reporting that can be done on climate justice. So the concept of climate justice emerged from the belief that those who have done the most to contribute to the climate crisis are the least likely to face its most severe impacts, as was already um, identified by Simone. Now, me personally, I see in this a dichotomy or a binary between two groups that are experiencing some type of friction. On one side, you have those who have done the most to contribute to the problem, um, weighing down the scale, while on the other side, you have those who stand to suffer the consequences. And you can attach um, different faces to both sides um, of that equation. Um, of the where, where, where you have this power differential. You could have perhaps a conversation about the highest emitters of greenhouse gases versus the lowest, richer nations versus poorer nations. And in this case, as I'm gonna look at today, um, the conversation about older generations versus younger generations. Um, as is inherent to the concept of, of um, generational equity, um, those for whom the policies are being made need to be included. They need to have a say in how these policies are being made and what these policy, what shape these policies are going to take. Um, so right now I'm gonna consider some of the, I'm um, sorry, Simone would have already laid out some of the intergenerational impacts of climate change. And I would wanna sort of look at how journalism can play a role in addressing all of that, starting with representation. I wanna, um, use this quote from former Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan, who once said, when we need to know about something, we go to experts, but we tend to forget that when we want to know about youths and what they feel and what they want, that we should talk to them. Um, I believe sometimes that this approach um, is an element that is lacking in terms of how um, climate justice is approached um, in, in the Caribbean. And I think that, um, we have an opportunity as journalists to apply pressure to perhaps change this a little bit. Um, so I came to these conclusions as I was preparing to go to COP26 because one of the first things I wanted to do um, is I had to write a story to prepare um, almost to sort of introduce what my area of focus would be at the, at the climate conference. And I actually kind of was a bit of a blank slate at the point in time. So I started off by making some phone calls to different stakeholders in civil society, government and youth activists. I wanted to know who's going to be there, what are their priorities? And I was really surprised to discover that in Trinidad and Tobago, there, was, there were going to be almost no civil society actors and almost no youth representatives headed to COP26. Um, there were only two um, youth representatives that I was able to find. Um, one was part of the national delegation, Priyanka Lala, uh, a, a UNICEF ambassador who's 14 years old. And another one, Shandell O'Neill, um, had to found a, a way to raise funds to carry herself to COP26 on her own terms, or sorry, on their own terms as they identify as um, gender non-binary. Um, um, so this immediately got me thinking that there's a story here about lack of representation of youth voices, because on one hand, you have the COP26 presidency constantly repeating that this is intended to be one of the most inclusive COPs um, that um, was ever, that is ever going to happen with small, the interests of small island developing states and youth being put at the forefront. 
But then on the other hand, um, in having conversations and in doing research, you come to discover that the there's a gap between the rhetoric and the action. Um, our voices were not going to be represented. So I expanded my, um, my scope of focus to the entire Caribbean and reached out through the Caribbean Youth Environment Network, CYEN, um, to learn more about the different um, young people in the region who were trying to make it to COP26, um, only to discover that almost none of them were able to do so um, because of challenges um, that they faced with regards to COVID, um, lack of funding, and um, just a general lack of support. Um, so, <clears throat> so right. So this was what I what I uncovered heading into COP twenty six. So, as part of sorry, how I went to COP twenty six, I was selected for a climate tracker fellowship. That is a youth led um, program that selects young people from around the world and creates opportunities for them to report on climate justice. And um, I was selected alongside journalists from different countries, um, all of which, um, um, sorry, for journalists from different countries, such as Monica Mondial from India, who's in, who was particularly interested in, in, interested in India's commitment to net zero, um, what pledges they would make um, with regards to mitigation. Um, as well as like Anthony Iswara from Indonesia, who was covering from his country's perspective, um, the, the push towards eliminating coal. Um, so I came to realize that the most important story that there was to tell from the Caribbean was one of representation, um, youth voices, civil society voices, but then also just in general as small island developing states who had a lot on the line with 1.5 degrees Celsius, um, limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius being a life or death um, sentence for our, for our um, small island developing states. So while there, um, some of the consequences of <clears throat> the absence of the youth activists that I immediately would have noticed was that without young people from our, from our region there. Because to be honest, I think at one point in time, we were invited um, to by the first minister of Scotland to have a conversation with her. And uh, very few Caribbean um, representatives were in that room. So it was a missed opportunity to speak with someone who had just pledged $1 million, um, $1 million towards sorry, she eventually raised it to $2 million, $2 million towards a loss and damage fund, which is the most critical, which is in my opinion, the most critical issue facing um, the Caribbean region right now with regards to climate justice. Um, I know a lot of you have been asking questions about how the recovery process has been going. And um, I would say, I recently had an opportunity to cover a story about the recovery process in Antigua and Barbuda, where Barbuda was hit by a hurricane in 2017, Hurricane Irma. And to this day, that recovery process is still ongoing. Um, the intergenerational impacts of that hurricane are uh, immediately apparent. One of the first things I was able to do when I got there was speak to people who have not been able to have their homes rebuilt despite the island um, having needed um, only to rebuild between 300 to 600 homes in total. And um, at COP26, this situation, this ongoing recovery process in Barbuda was one of the most discussed topics at COP26. Um, Alok Sharma as the um, president, the COP26 president immediately made mention to it at the opening plenary, um, which brought it into my um, area of focus. I wanted to, 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 to sort of tell the most pertinent stories that I could about a collective Caribbean focus. Um, and that loss and damage conversation seemed really important because obviously in Barbuda with um, this recovery process taking longer than four years, they're still vulnerable and there is an ongoing crisis there whereby 
the many people, many activists on the island believe that their very recovery process could possibly be making them less climate resilient as their, their developmental, um, there's a development project on the island taking place within a Ramsar protected um, wetland area. That's their Kajunta National Lagoon um, Park. So the island could possibly be hit by another hurricane before this recovery process is complete and it could be even less climate resilient than it would have been um, at the last, the last time that it was hit by a hurricane. And then you have other islands um, such as Dominica that were also hit um, by hurricanes in, in 2017, which was a pretty, um, particularly um, catastrophic year for hurricanes in the Caribbean. So it's an ongoing conversation where there needs to, um, there needs to be a loss and damage fund created for Caribbean islands to be able to access emergency funding to address, um, to address um, rapid onset events such as hurricanes and to be able to, to, to facilitate a recovery process on short notice. So one of the big conversations that um, was taking place at the conference um, was with regards to what is the best way of, of, of um, of addressing um, the loss and loss and damage with with um, small island developing states advocating for the creation of the loss and damage fund, which eventually led to a loss and damage dialogue, which stops which stops short of actually creating a contingency fund that can be accessed and instead um, just transfers the conversation to Egypt. Um, while a lot of the richer nations wanted something totally different, which was for there to be um, a further operationalization of the Santiago network, which was also put into the Glasgow, into the Glasgow agreement. Um, but with the Santiago network, um, what you have there is a system whereby assistance comes from outside. Um, technical assistance comes from richer nations and um, we would be dependent um, on that support from outside, which has not proven so far to be the most effective approach. Um, as, as, as would be said by some of the um, people who I would have sp spoken with at the conference. So, <clears throat> so other consequences of the absence of younger in, um, activists, um, there's a reduced potential to inspire other young people at home to take climate action. I think when we don't see ourselves represented at the at, at um, a climate conference such as COP26. So many announcements are being made um, and our activists, our youth activists are not present to perhaps give that um, feedback on site about what do they think about something um, that has just been announced. For example, Chandel O'Neill um, was one of the two youth activists who was there, was particularly passionate about the, about the operationalization of the Santiago network to address loss and damage because um, she, um, they believe that um, it's like me, they believe that it's one of the most pertinent um, issues facing the Caribbean region right now. And um, they were able to speak on this issue and, and comment on the eventual, um, the eventual outcome and have their, their, their story be told by the international media. But with only those two activists present, um, Priyanka and, and, um, and Chandel, it was very difficult for their message to, um, to they, they, it was a very limited message based off of what the specific activists who were there um, were able to communicate because with very few people in the room, um, there's very little ability to, 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 to influence um, the, the media coverage. <clears throat> so in addition to the absence of youth activists, um, from the Caribbean region, there was also not there were also not met very many um, journalists from the Caribbean region who were at COP26. 
Um, there was someone who did a study while at COP26 about how many small island developing state journalists were um, represented, or, and they requested from the COP26 presidency um, an official tally, and the COP26 presidency declined to provide one. And just through word of mouth conversations, they were eventually able to find me. And um, we had a conversation and uh, we spoke about a lot of the challenges that um, that Caribbean um, journalists face to be able to make it to COP20 to, to COP26, namely being that um, our, our, obviously our media houses would not necessarily have the funding to do that. So we would have to, to look at fellowship opportunities as the best way towards trying to make it to this type of climate type of climate conference. Um, so some of the opportunities though, that I think um, exist for um, journalists from the Caribbean is to really try to put a human face, I think, to the announcements that are being made um, with regards to, um, to agreements and whatnot that happen at the at at the climate conferences. So many times, um, I would have noticed that things would be announced. Um, one of which, perhaps, um, C um, Simone actually just mentioned, which was the commission for investigating um, for investigating um, loss and damage through legal avenues to to consider whether there could be reparations. Um, or whether um, the world's largest emitters could be held legally accountable through international law. Um, a lot of times um, these announcements would be made on the world stage and by being there in person, um, a, a journalist would have the opportunity to perhaps have off the record conversations with people um, from, from different party delegations and whatnot that you might not be able to report on directly, but might point you in the, in the correct direction to sort of figure out what the backstory for something is. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah. Um, so I kind of want to touch back on my experience in Antigua and Barbuda, um, reporting on Sorry, sorry, yeah. Zico. Mm -hmm. you probably need to be quick because we're running, we're running short on time. Just a heads up. Okay, no problem. Sorry, right. thank you. Um, okay, so what I'd probably like to do then is just close off by suggesting some areas of focus for climate um, justice reporting. I think one of the most critical things that needs to happen is there needs to be some follow up with hurricane victims on different islands as their stories often continue months to years after impact. Um, that's especially true um, on the island of Barbuda, where shortly after the hurricane hit, the, um, one of the first things that took place was that the, their communal land ownership system, it's actually a very progressive system that exists almost um, in nowhere else in the world. In fact, if you're a Barbudan citizen, if you were born in Barbuda, right, you have a collective stake in the land's ownership. And even shortly after the island was hit by the hurricane, um, the law, the Barbuda Land Act, which codifies that system into law, was, was amended so as to remove um, that, that, that birthright that all Barbudans enjoy. And um, the, re the, the reason that was done is because the vision for recovery that the government had it, um, involved um, the introduction of a luxury housing complex um, for outsiders um, that once populated, once that project is complete, would fundamentally alter the island by doubling the population of the island, as well as um, it's being built within a protected wetland which protects the, um, the, the one um, town where the people of Barbuda live, Codrington, which protects Codrington from storm surges. So um, based on that, there are many people on the island who believe 
that um, the recovery process could possibly make them more vulnerable um, if they were to be hit by another hurricane. Um, and that, is, that has le led to a very protracted um, recovery process. Um, so there are many stories to be told there. There are people who have been displaced. Um, I had the opportunity to speak with some young people who were not able to live with their parents. They're living in, in Antigua because their, their parents want to remain on the island while the, while the legal battle over the status of their land, communal land ownership system continues. Um, so as to not lose, lose rights to the land that they are already occupy. Um, another thing that I think we need to do more of is speak to youth activists about climate solutions. I think especially in the lead up to Egypt. Um, one of the things that I, th um, good things that I think came out of the story that I wrote, um, highlighting the youth who were having difficulty headed towards, um, headed towards Glasgow was that it, it, it did eventually, it, it led to the ones that I highlighted getting contacted by stakeholders, getting invited to panel discussions. Um, even the ones who, whose quotes I used simply to state that they couldn't go, it led to opportunities for them to offer commentary and feedback about what, what they wanted to see take place. Um, Another thing I think is very important for the Caribbean region is we need to seek out individuals who are displaced or negatively affected by development projects. Um, beyond just Barbuda, in several islands, these luxury hotel proposals, they come about um, and they are met with um, a, a lot of pushback. Um, we, we need to really put a human face to these stories and talk about how actual people's lives are changed, um, what it means for them. Um, I think two other things that I would probably point to is I think that there's a lot of um, interesting stories that we can tell about Guyana um, and as it continues it's um, entry into the oil and gas sector. And um, I think there's a, a lot of more reporting that we can do about how indigenous people and different people in Guyana will be affected. Uh, I think that would be, could become, um, would be a, um, a climate justice story. And in Trinidad and Tobago, where we have most of our emphasis in our NDCs on cutting emissions through transportation sector, I think, you know, there's an opportunity to ask more questions about what a just energy transition would look like. I know there's a, there's a draft um, in place, um, I, I, but I think that it's something that um, we could tell a lot of stories about. Um, ultimately, I think what I would hope to maybe inspire from my experience is that I was able to, I think, try um, tell stories that linked um, different experiences that different people were having on different islands um, and sort of united under one umbrella. Um, it always came back to, for me, it always came back to climate justice, the loss and damage conversation that comes back to, it was ultimately one of, of climate justice. Um, speaking about, um, when I look um, turn my lens more specifically towards my home country, which is Trinidad and Tobago, we have an oil and gas sector asking questions about a, a just transition. That is a question of climate justice. So I think that it is the most important, um, the, the most important type of reporting that we need to see more of coming out of Trinidad and Tobago while at COP26, I did feel overwhelmed because I felt like being the only journalist there who, when I say an independent journalist rather, just to be you more know, yeah. Zeke, sorry, we're about to have to have to uh, cut you off because okay. we got a little bit of time for questions, but if you want to just wrap up real quick. Sorry. Oh, okay, yeah. 
Um, so, okay, uh, do, sorry, do you need to cut now or can I? Uh, yeah, we, we better cut because we've only got uh, about six minutes for questions, so. Okay, that's good. Cool, sorry, thank you very much, Zico. That was great, uh, a good roundup of these problems from Simone and then a, a good roundup of some of the challenges covering them from you. And we did get in some, some good story ideas more while you're talking. Um, Linda Straker suggested one on reduced population in Grenada and the wider OECS and climate change as a factor, possibly via migration. Wesley suggested recovery processes in Barbuda, Abaco and others. Has the rebuilding process included climate smart solutions, regulations? Um, Nesha Abaraj said there is also a need to have some kind of international or regional protection for climate refugees should an island become inhabitable, uninhabitable due to extreme weather patterns. Uh, without legal protection, persons forced to migrate become more susceptible to human trafficking, exploitation, and that kind of thing. So that's a great, I think, a great story idea. Um, Nesha also pointed out, and sorry if I'm saying your name wrong, that there have been instances of aid workers being taken advantage, taking advantage of women and girls and after cyclones in, in Mozambique. Uh, so a lot of good story ideas here coming out and we'll compile them and I'm sure everybody will talk about them later on. And there were a couple of questions for Simone as well. I wanted to put to her, if you're still with us, Simone. Uh, Rondell Smith had asked, how do you combat or address a situation where a government is guilty of approving projects that exploit crucial ecosystems? And I think that was a story idea, but I thought that would also be an interesting question that you might have some impact on, some uh, input on, Simone. Yeah, that's a really, um, that's a really good question, a really good um, angle to, to cover um, a story. Uh, but <clears throat> like I mentioned, um, litigation has been increasingly used. There are, there's the example of in Guyana, that is something that could be explored. There's also, I mean, many of us know about fishermen and friends of the sea in Trinidad. Won't go into too much detail about that, but we do know that um, litigation is a strategy. Um, another thing is activism, and this is increasingly important among young people um, and I could give a very contemporary example of the Graham Hall um, wetlands in Barbados and it's the last remaining wetland in Barbados and right now it's not protected and there's a activist group that is right now lobbying for the protection of the mangrove um, I would love if, if anybody from Barbados could give a little bit more context because I actually just found out about it from Twitter and they're really active on Twitter and you know I just started engaging with them and I can't say whether the wetland is actually currently being damaged but the fact that um, if it's not and the activism is is happening right now mean, means that that is a proactive measure which is very important and very welcome and it is I think 100% young people um so yeah those are two very pertinent um examples that I can give right now of those strategies strategies litigation and activism and I just want to also say that activism is a very touchy thing um because it, it requires a lot of uh support and a lot of courage and a lot of boldness and I think that young people have this um, but I think that there's there's a lot more support that can be put behind um, young people and, um, and you know this is something that could be developed and it, it, it has been shown throughout other parts of the world to be an effective measure. Thank you. Um, another question was from Christine, and she, she's posed this as a question and a story idea, but I think it might be something you would want to speak to. Uh, what does the future of adaptation in the Caribbean look like uh, when we already know 
the implications of degradation of mangroves and seawalls and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. And then I think this is a very important question for journalists. Uh, how do we want to shape this for people to be aware of um of of what it of what it could be? I just simply I just painted a picture. I'm I showed you what what's happening, what has happened, what worked, what could work, what didn't work, and I I also didn't um go into much detail about the other features of adaptation and mitigation and issues um that we are dealing with in the Caribbean with regard to um, climate change. And, and I think um, it's, it's definitely something that, that could, be, could be tackled from a, from a journalistic perspective. Yeah, yeah, good. I think so. I think you're right about that. Um, one comment here from Karen Bascom. And again, sorry if I'm saying the name wrong. That I missed. I think this is a, a story idea, but it also might be something you wanted to comment on, Simone. Um, Simone is very right. Entrepreneurs and NGOs know what their path to sustainability is, but the available projects and programs say otherwise for reasons that are out of context with the realities on the ground. These projects slash programs slash policies never provide what the grassroots leaders and community problem solvers actually need. Would you say that that's a, probably there's a story idea in there that uh, is, is, is really important? Definitely, definitely. I mean, I've been, I am, I love grassroots uh, type focused um, activities, projects, and I, I've seen it, you know, there's, there's a lot of disconnect. I could speak for Trina and Tobago only, but there's a lot of disconnect where, um, the grantees, the grassroots organizations, and the implementers um, of the, the, the implementing agencies and whoever is granting them um, these funds, there's a lot of disconnect and there needs to be um there needs to be more connect between them. There needs to be more understanding of the social context, the de de developmental context, the economic context, the cultural context, um, in order to make these initiatives work in the first place, but also be sustainable. There needs to be continuous and consistent discourse um, between all of the actors. Makes sense, thanks. Uh, Sorry. Um, we have one more real quick question and then we have to wrap up. And that question is from Steve. And he says, is legislation the end point of activism? Oh, definitely. <laughs> definitely not. Um, legislation is just the start. I mean, that's where, that's where the work begins because we all know um, in the Caribbean, there's a lot of legislation that speaks to so many different issues, especially in um, the environmental sphere. And there's very little enforcement of these laws. And, and that's, that comes down to the socio-cultural, socio-economic context. Um, you know, so, so legislation is definitely not the end point. Um, in fact, it should be like a it should be like um, what, what should we call us a, a buckle on the belt? I, I don't know um, I don't know yeah <laughs> you know what I mean right? Yeah, sure. Um, but yeah, so so it's a it's a good thing. It could be considered a win. It's definitely not the end point. Okay, well, thank you very much, and I'm sorry we don't have more time for questions, but that was fantastic, and we really appreciate it from from you, Simone, and from you, Zico. No problem. I am very, very glad that we got this opportunity. Um, especially me as a non-journalist on the I'm on the next side of the um spectrum. Very, very happy that um there were a lot of story ideas that came out of this. Um and that, that was the that was the point, you know. I don't think journalists have a uh duty to communicate to the public the the um, issues of climate change, especially in the in the Caribbean context. So, 
Sounds fine with me. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Freeman. And thank you to our, your panelists, Zico and Simone, for doing such a wonderful job, a great, great job. Thank you so much. Um, I should let you all know for the journalists in the room, there is a follow-up to this webinar um, series. We weren't going to announce it till next week, but um, I think the story ideas have, have caused me to jump the gun here, Wesley. So the follow-up is we're actually going to be funding um, what we hope will be a series of stories on climate justice. So you all have some great starting points right there. One of them will definitely be a regional collaboration, which um, the editorial committee will decide upon. But if you have other story ideas, please submit them to micstoryideas at gmail.com. That is going to be the starting point for us to formalize which are the ones we will cover so that we could get the discussion going as actively as we can. So we, um, we hope you all welcome that information. And this, as I said, it signals the start of something wonderful for us all. We're moving into our final session for this morning. And it is a session by Dr. Alaric Trotz, Mapping the Caribbean's Climate Change Journey, Outcomes, Expectations, Shortfalls, and Pitfalls. Quite a mouthful, very, very important for us to understand. And Dr. Trotz is the Director and Science Advisor of the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center. He's based in Belize. A very special good morning to you, sir. I know you are up extra early to do this for us. Uh, good morning everybody and uh, thank you very much to uh, MIC for having me as part of this uh, exercise. Uh, one correction, uh, I was formerly the Deputy Director and Science Advisor to the Caribbean Community Climate Center. I'm now uh, retired. Uh, so uh, it's going to be a challenge basically for me to encapsulate in this short time the journey uh, the Caribbean has taken to address climate change. Uh, now, I would say for over two decades. Uh, can we move to the first slide, please? Our journey uh, started, uh, we can say that. The genesis of climate change activities in the Caribbean basically was the United Nations uh, Conference on uh, Sustainable Development, UNCED, on Environment and Development, which was held in Brazil in 1992. Uh, the Caribbean was very well prepared for that uh, conference. Uh, we had a Caribbean Task Force on Environment uh, multi-country, multidisciplinary, including our uh, political representation in that task force. So we went into that uh, meeting very well prepared. Uh, as a result, uh, at the end of the meeting, uh, we, along with all the small island developing states, uh, asked that we should have, the UN should organize a special meeting for SIDS, small island developing states, uh, to look at the whole issue of uh, environment and sustainable development. That meeting occurred two years after 1994 in Barbados. Next slide, please. And the main outcome of that meeting was the Barbados Program of Action, which was a 14 point program that identified priority areas and specific actions to address challenges faced by SIDS. It was environmental problems at the top of the list. At the top of the list, the highest priority was accorded to climate change and sea level rise. And if you look through the list, natural and environmental disasters, waste management, coastal and marine resources, transportation, biodiversity, energy, your fresh water resource, you'll see that now that we have a firmer grip on climate change, uh, we see that climate change has an influence and a connection in every one of these uh, uh, categories. Uh, next. Uh, as a result of that uh, meeting, uh, CARICOM, 
along with the got together a team. Uh, at the time, it was the University of the West Indies Center for Environment and Development. That's no longer uh, in existence. It was based at uh, Mona, and at the time, under the leadership of uh, uh, Professor Vishnu Prasad, <clears throat> uh, they got together and basically made an approach to the World Bank and the organization uh, of American states to pursue resources from what at the time was the financial mechanism of the convention, uh, which was the environmental facility. It still is a financial mechanism for the uh, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, as a result, uh, they got approval for the first climate change project in the Caribbean. This was in 1997. Uh, three, the CPAC project, the Caribbean Planning for Adaptation for Climate Change, uh, which was a project, uh, the organization in those days, the Jeff would disburse the money to the World Bank, which was the what they call the implementing agency. And they then went through the OAS, which was the executing agency. And the actual implementation was carried out by a small implementation unit uh, based in, uh, in Surmes in Barbados. And I had the, uh, the, the honor really to be the first uh, project manager of the CPAC project, hence my involvement uh, in climate change. CPAC project was designed to address climate change impacts, mainly at the time looking at sea level rise. Uh, that was a four-year project. No sooner had we started work on that project, we realized that uh, the multiple issues that we had to address, uh, we would need a follow-up project. And so we started to talk to the World Bank about that. Uh, they, they agreed and we started to do uh, to enter negotiations with the Jeff uh, for another project. However, those uh, negotiations were drawn out and we realized that we're coming to the end of CPAC with no uh, follow-up project in sight. Luckily at the time, the Canadians came on board and SEED at the time had announced uh, a new fund the, the Canadian Climate Change Development Fund. And we were encouraged to apply to that fund for support. And hence, we had another project, uh, the ACCC project, the Adaptation to Climate Change in the Caribbean uh, project, which uh, was a bridge between the first Jeff funded project and the next funded Jeff project which came on board in 24 at the end of ACCC. And that was the MAC project, the Mainstreaming Adaptation to Climate Change project. So we had a succession, three successive projects, uh, one funded by CEDA and the other two by the Jeff. Uh, and by that time, uh, our Climate Change Center had come into being. And in 2008, uh, we got another uh, support from the Global Environmental Facility for a fund, the, sp the Special Pilot for Adaptation to Climate Change. This was the first time that the Jeff were going to disburse money for the actual implementation of climate change. And the region, through the work we had done, were the first to draw down on that fund and as a result, the first to start addressing uh, implementation of, that, of adaptation. That was well since about 2009. Next slide, please. Next slide. Trying, having a little issue here, sorry. Oops.
yeah now now let's put these uh acti these projects into in when uh the first enunciation of the uh unfcc <clears throat> uh goals etc there was a heavy heavy uh sort of emphasis on mitigation and it was an instance of aosis and other developing countries that we insinuated the issue of adaptation as being equally important and as a result under the umbrella of the convention they established something called the intergovernmental uh, negotiating committee that was asked to look at how countries should approach adaptation and they came up with this three step uh, stage stage three stage uh, approach stage one and stage two which was building capacity for adaptation and further capacity for adaptation and stage three was the implementation of adaptation uh, and when we looked at the work we had done when we started on the SPAC project, we realized that CPAC, AC, MAC, the first three projects were actually stage one and stage two uh, uh, adaptation activities. And the SPAC was a stage three, that was actual implementation. So there was really a logic to the approach that the Caribbean has made to uh, understanding adaptation and to implementing adaptation. Next. Uh, what did we do in those stages? Very quickly, the first thing was to establish multi-stakeholder national climate change committees and national focal points for climate change right throughout the Caribbean. And they're still in existence and you should know about them. Uh, we had encouraged that these should sit in either the office of the prime minister or those countries that have it, the office of the president. And the reason was by the time we realized that uh, climate change was basically uh, touching so many different sectors. And so we needed it to be at the centerpiece of national uh, development. Uh, we built national capacity to participate as part of regional team in international negotiations. Uh, the, we have also built national capacity to develop all the different reports that our countries have to make to the convention, national communications, adaptation plans, mitigation plans, and more recently what they call nationally determined contributions, NDCs. Uh, at a regional level, uh, capacity of our technical personnel through a variety of regional workshops as we develop uh, the modalities. Uh, we established a master's, under the Canadian program, we established a master's program in climate change at UWI at CERMIS, which is still going. And most of the representatives, uh, national focal points and the active people on the ground throughout the Caribbean, most of them have passed through this uh, training course. Uh, we coordinate regional representation at international negotiations. Every year, uh, basically, we get uh, issue, papers, uh, issue papers developed. Uh, we bring our negotiators together. We basically leave the Caribbean to go into those negotiations with a regional uh, position. Uh, of course, public awareness for public and policy makers, including the political directorate, one of our biggest challenges, uh, and uh, strengthening our regional institutions with specific roles in implementation. The center sees itself basically as facilitating the work of institutions to address climate change. We don't do for it. We we are not don't see that we will be the experts in uh, implementing things on the uh, agricultural umbrella, the SCARDI, uh, in terms of climate services and climate data and forecasts, CIMH, uh, and very important, uh, which I'll speak about a little bit more, uh, our, our climate modeling group. 
uh, they, and of course, uh, through the course on the DEMAC, we uh, developed the Climate Change Center. The Climate Change Center, uh, which I was with since its establishment in 2005. This tells you how we arrive at the decision on adaptation. The first thing is downscaling global climate models. Uh, when we started, uh, the only projections of future climate were from global models that operated in a 300 kilometer square. And of course, no, hardly and none of the Caribbean was visible in, ever, in any of these grids. And so we had to resort partnership with the Hadley Center in the UK and uh, some of our regional institutions uh, to use their regional climate change projections, which at the time was operating at a 50 kilometer squared grid. I'm very proud to say that we are now in the Caribbean with the capacity to, to provide uh, projections at the 10 kilometer square grid, highly regio specific. So we can actually provide projections. We, we, sorry about that. We, 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 we could actually provide projections uh, for watersheds in any particular territory. Uh, we develop on the basis of those projections, climate change scenarios, which we feed in to impact models, crop models in agriculture, hydrology models in water, understand the impacts on the basis of that design adaptation options, do cost benefit analysis of adaptation options and decide uh, on which option uh, is most suitable for uh, for implementation, but this is the science of climate change, which basically uh, forms the sort of, uh, is the basis on, on the action we take. Next slide, please. A very quick word about this. This, this is a, a tremendous uh, uh, asset to the Caribbean. Uh, in order for us to carry out the modeling, no one institution in the region had the capacity to do that. But we formed a consortium with INSMET, Institute of Meteorology of Cuba, the Climate Studies Group at Mona, which is now leading this uh, consortium, so ably led by Professor Michael Taylor, uh, the Climate Studies, uh, the Computer Studies Group uh, in Barbados, the, uh, the Center in Belize, Hadley Center in UK, University of Suriname, and at the time, at one time, uh, UW under Dr. Agar's group uh, in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, a little bit more about them. Uh, they are now able to produce these uh, projections. And after Paris, the IPCC asked for a document uh, basically a report, to a scientific report to support the 1.5 position. And we are very proud to say that our group in short space of two years produced four peer reviewed papers that were cited in the, in the final report. Uh, now, a very, the, under the uh, ACCC project, uh, we were able to put together the proposal for heads of government for the establishment of the center. Uh, the, we got that agreement at Kanoan in 2002. At that meeting, we were aware that governments were considering cutting back on subventions for regional institutions. And we basically uh, went into that meeting to the government said, we don't need your subventions. And uh, as a result, we got their agreement. Go ahead, if, if you don't need subventions from government, no problem. Uh, it became operational uh, in Belize. Belize offered to host, that's a long story, but it eventually came to Belize. And we were entrusted after the center was, uh, was established, the MAC project was on the road. That project, uh, we had moved from the 
the hierarchy, it was the World Bank implementing agency, but we will replace the OAS, OAS with the CARICOM uh, secretariat. And they basically uh, were in charge at the midterm review of the MAC, uh, it was agreed that the management of projects in the future climate change projects would be uh, passed to the center. Uh, so the center completed the MAC project and started the implementation of the SPAC project, which was the first project addressing implementation of uh, adaptation in the Caribbean. Uh, they also, uh, for the first time, the center managed to get funds from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office for a significant project in the overseas territories, uh, which basically was uh, going through the whole capacity building, helping them to the understand vulnerability, understand uh, what impacts would be, and to fashion uh, climate change adaptation policies, which basically would be implemented. The next, next slide. Uh, another, I think it's important to bring to your attention that uh, we do have, the, the center was mandated by heads of government to develop a regional uh, strategy for climate change, which is the document of the extreme right. Uh, having done that, uh, th that strategy was approved in 2009 uh, and they asked for uh, implementation plan which was approved. So we have a regional implementation plan for a regional uh, strategy. And interestingly enough, uh, the, the middle document is the Lillian Dahl de Declaration. Governments, uh, the center had worked through, we reported to COTED and through COTED, we got climate change on the agenda of heads. Uh, and I want to bring to your attention the ne next slide, the Liliandal Declaration, which we'll talk about more on Tuesday. This was the Liliandal Declaration in 2009 at the heads meeting in Georgetown in 2009. And this is one, one clause from it, which I read that all parties to the UNFCC should work with an increased sense of urgency and purpose towards arriving at an ambitious and comprehensive agreement at COP15 in Copenhagen in 2009, which provides for long-term stabilization of atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations at levels which will ensure that global average surface temperature increases will be limited well below 1.5. We were on the 1.5 phase first uh, globally in 2009, and we actually went to COP armed with buttons that were financed by the British High Commission in, uh, in, uh, in Guyana, and some very energetic uh, members of CYN, ably led by Reggie, Dirk, Reggie Burke. And we, were, we distributed buttons, 1.5 to stay alive buttons in 2009, at Copenhagen. And thanks to the persistence of our negotiators over the years, we managed to get this reflected as a goal, a legitimate goal under the Paris Agreement. Next. Uh, just uh, a quick look at in what we've been doing on the adaptation. Next. This, of course, was a, a water issue. This was Bekwe, where during drought seasons, water had to be shipped from the main island uh, into Bekwe, barged over. And we basically were the first to implement this concept, this approach, salt water reverse osmosis systems, but totally powered by photovoltaics. Uh, here on the left is the system on the right is the uh, power system, which was put on the top of the, uh, the airport hangar. 
And that energy was fed into the grid. Uh, it, they, we designed it so that the energy generated there was much greater than what the SWRO plant would use. Uh, at the end of the day, the electrical utility would basically subtract the excess energy and pay the water utility for the excess energy put in the grid so that they had money to maintain the system. Uh, we repeated this in Pitti Martinique, in Cariacou. Uh, we used the concept of uh, switch to renewable energy in Kikorka. Uh, it's interesting, this was since about 20, 2010, 2011. Around 2016, we got an invitation from some American uh, institutions to a seminar to discuss the feasibility of marrying renewable energy with water, uh, with water generation. And we were being charged 350 US dollars for, uh, for registration. After we had been in this business for a very long time before that. Next. Uh, the, the again water. This was the Cocos. I think uh, is a luxury hotel just by the airport in Saint Lucia, uh, where there was is, there were issues with water use in the view watershed. Uh, you had uh, farmers. You had manufacturing. You had domestic, and of course you had the luxury hotel. So guess who got the water basically as a priority during shortages, the hotel. Uh, so we worked with a hotel to put in a very extensive uh, half, rainwater harvesting system and a gray water recycling uh, system, which allowed them to use that gray water to water their 18 hole uh, golf course. And the rainwater harvesting, of course, fed into their extensive swimming pools, et cetera. Interestingly enough, the owner of this hotel, when he realized how this intervention would redound to his profits at the end of the day, uh, because he didn't have to have that outlay for huge water bills, uh, he actually put a lot of his money in speeding it up. Years later, we visited this facility and we were quite pleased to see that he had extended the rain water harvesting and the gray water uh, recycling facilities. Again, water on the right, which is about uh, working with uh, farmers and a, a lot of the work there was management of water with drip irrigation. Next slide, I have to go through these very quickly. Uh, a water issue again on the left, uh, shoreline uh, protection uh, from uh, erosion and inundation. And the building on the right is the Martian building in St. Lucia, which we upgraded uh, so that it could withstand the category four hurricane, much more than that. It now has its own power system, photovoltaic system. It now has an extensive water harvesting system. And the whole idea is that the building would be functional before, during, after a storm. And we are trying to use this idea for all shelters in the Caribbean. And it's also the basis of thought that is going into the uh, Barbados, uh, uh, sorry, that is going into the PAHO Regional Smart Hospitals program. Uh, the whole idea is that after a storm, uh, during a storm, these facilities uh, should be functioning. Next. Uh, and the, I want to spend, this uh, is a critical issue. Uh, I've shown you all of this to tell you that as a region, we know, we know what we have to do. We have a pretty fair idea which direction we need to go, but we don't have the resources. This is one of the basic battles we have and is one of the biggest issues under the climate justice umbrella. 
They're talking about $100 billion a year uh, since Copenhagen, uh, since Cancun, uh, sorry, since Cancun, and up to now, we can't see that, anything like that. Uh, anyway, the Green Climate Fund, as you know, is now the financing uh, mechanism for the UNFCCC. And uh, we had uh, basically expressed a lot of dissatisfaction with the Jeff and the Adaptation Fund. And we felt that uh, we needed to have much more uh, interface with the funding agency and cut out all these, uh, well, for want of a better word, middle, the world banks, et cetera, so that they will be direct disbursement to regional and national entities. Uh, we, the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center is now what is known as a regional implementing entity to the Green Climate Fund. What that means is that we can prepare projects for the region and submit to the Green Climate Fund. Uh, we are eligible for funds, uh, 50 million US dollars grant per, per project. Uh, and that would be disbursed through the center. The center will be responsible for implementation. Uh, the Caribbean Development Bank is also a regional implementing entity. Our accreditation as a center is for pure grant finance. For the Caribbean Development Bank is grant and concessional loans. Uh, so we have two regional implementing agencies and there are national implementing agencies and the first globally to be approved was the Department of Environment, Ministry of Health and Environment and the government of Antigua and Barbuda. And they also had their first uh, project. At, they are eligible for grants up to 10 million US dollars per project. They've had their first project approved. Uh, and Recently, the Protected Areas Conservation Trust here in uh, Belize gained their uh, accreditation as a national implementing agency. So we have these agencies in the region. Uh, that's just the beginning of the, uh, of the problem. Uh, it isn't easy to get money out of the system. Uh, you put in a concept note and there's a lot of to in and fro and three years down the line uh, before you might, if they approve, see the first disbursement. And uh, there's a total disconnect with the pace at which uh, we can get to implementation uh, to get the finance and what the science is telling us about the amount of time we have uh, to, to respond. And the final slide that I share with you this morning, uh, it's about a, our first project that we got approved. Uh, it's a water resilience project for the Barbados Water Authority. We worked with them. Uh, and it, is, it started in 2018, will be finished in 2024. 2024. It's, we managed to get a grant of 27.6 million US dollars uh, on the, th this project. Uh, the rest, the 17.6 was uh, budgeted uh, upgrades that the, the company, the Water Authority had uh, program. And it's to address first and foremost, renewable energy, clean energy. Uh, you might ask why? A lot of us don't realize that a major cost center for water, provision of water is energy costs. And uh, so uh, we are providing the Barbados Water Authority with the facility there. There is a gas turbine and, uh, and it's a combination of a gas turbine, not totally renewable, but certainly uh, low carbon footprint and what they have now, and photovoltaic. So they will be totally uh, off the grid. Uh, the revolving adaptation fund is basically for uh, water projects uh, that are approved by a certain process and implemented really at the community level. 
non-revenue water, a lot of us don't know that a lot of our uh, water provision services, uh, they treat the water, but in distribution, they lose in some cases up to about 40 to 50% of that water. Uh, this project is addressing that by repairing a lot of the distribution lines uh, so that that uh, water is now available. Uh, we're providing water storage for uh, some key uh, public buildings, including the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. There, the whole idea is that they must not run out of water regardless of uh, whether there's a storm or not. Rainwater harvesting for vulnerable communities uh, the, 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 who have been identified, identified and also water resources master plan. Together with the rainwater harvesting, we're boosting the capacity of the water authority to distribute water uh, by providing them with the trucks, et cetera. And that is to these same communities that have to put in water harvesting facilities, just in case during the drought, their, uh, their containers uh, run out of water. And of course, uh, capacity building. Now, we would hope that this would be a template for repetition throughout the region in addressing the water issue of our water authorities. Grenada has a similar project approved, but they got a full grant of 42 million US dollars, but it's being managed not by the center, they went through the GIZ. So that's totally a, a, a different approach. Uh, but as I say, this is our first uh, project and we are just completing with the water the second project, which will address wastewater, the wastewater issue, upgrading the South Coast uh, uh, sewerage system and basically using the wastewater, recycling it uh, for agriculture. Uh, so this is the a concept that was fully uh, supported by uh, the late uh, Hugh Seeley, uh, my good friend who passed away recently. He was, uh, he gave the center, I know my colleagues were working with BWI and this, and he opened several doors. It's part of his vision, was part of his vision, vision about wastewater recycling uh, uh, from sewerage and uh, other things that are going to appear in that project. So we really appreciated uh, his effort. So uh, I hope is that I would have alerted you to the, what is going on in the Caribbean. Uh, and certainly, for, uh, I think, you know, you should be a bit intrusive now with these groups. Uh, you know, COP is coming up. You know that there is a national and regional process for preparing for that. The media should be present. As a fact, I, I would like to see a stronger media presence at the international meetings. Uh, we'll have a daily broadcast of events, interviews, basically to the entire uh, Caribbean. I think we want to go. I th it's so important that we, as I say, insinuate climate change issues into the regional psyche. We should be talking about this. We should be discussing this. There are a whole set of issues to related to climate justice that basically demands uh, national uh, and stakeholder uh, participation in some of the decisions that are being made about our future in the Caribbean. Well, I hope in that very brief and hurried fashion, I would have left you with a fair impression of the extent of uh, activity in the Caribbean. We have a lot to be proud of, and I, I, I can't end out again uh, talking about the excellent work that is being done by Professor Taylor and his group uh, at the UWI. 
They've made us proud. They put Caribbean climate science on the global map, and they continue to provide us with the type of knowledge base that we need to make the type of decisions that we ought to be making uh, in terms of building climate resilience uh, throughout the Caribbean. And why, why I have the floor, a very quick thing about why we are interested in mitigation. Uh, the reason, simple reason is that we cannot afford the costs uh, of our present architecture, the energy sector. In the 80s, when we had the uh, spike in uh, energy prices, some of our country had to fork out more than 50% of the for, uh, foreign services uh, for the foreign exchange earnings to pay for fossil fuel. Sustainable. So we have the opportunity now under the climate change umbrella to use uh, the occasion to move totally to a zero carbon uh, energy sector. Well, I will stop there now, so we'll have some time for, for questions. Thank you so much, Neville. I have been given the honor to, to moderate your session. Um, I think in, in, as a salute to youth, the two of us, you know, we're, we're put together, put together to do this, to do this aspect of it. Um, I want to, I want to tell some things about the school. I, have, I wouldn't let an opportunity like this pass without saying that the tapans that I have been able to learn and do over the years have all been Guyanese influenced. Between never between Dr. Trotz and the late Professor Charles McDavid, that's how I got my introduction into into the whole climate the cool climate change era during the CPAC project. So I want personally to thank you. I haven't had a chance to thank you personally, publicly for a while, you know, for, for that introduction. I've been tasked with monitoring the chat for, for questions, but before we go on to that, I think there were some suggestions and questions coming out of, uh, of Simone Ganpat. So I want to ask Simone to address her questions and concerns to, to Dr. Trotz directly while we have our our little side chatter, chatter going on. So Simone, could you, could you just roughly translate some of the comments you've made in the chat? Sure, thank you very much, um, Dr. Schwartz. That's a very, very interesting presentation. Um, and a lot of the things that you spoke about, I thought about while preparing my presentation. So plenty, plenty of things, it was, it was very, um, it's very relevant and pertinent and you know um but but um very well expressed and one of the um the questions that i had was um you know it's it's all of this is science related it's um on regional um implementation scales multilateral bilateral um and i wanted to know what is the extent? Um, of course, this might just be you given one example, um, but what is the extent of the social integration in the in the project life cycle, in the project design implementation, the the monitoring and evaluation, you know? Because um that's that's really important. All of these things, um I, I think I was explaining my presentation, like all of these, the, some of the climate change adaptation um, projects, they have the same name. The first one was in 2001, the last one was in 2016, and they sound the same. So how am I, how am I supposed to know that there's any um, progress in terms of the people, you know? Especially in the context of your seeing um, that there's, while, while I, we can't agree, I suppose, that um, awareness is increasing. Um, there's still a, a lot of, um, there's a lot of work to be done in terms of addressing it on the ground and in, in the Caribbean society. So I really wanted to ask to what aspect is, is the social aspect, um, to what degree is the social aspect integrated in these projects life cycle? Well, we are in an era now where uh, we are being asked by the funding agencies to ensure 
that the project has been formulated after full consultation with those whom we are planning to affect. Uh, if you look now at requirements, uh, we are asked not only to do uh, environmental impact assess assessments, but environmental and social impact assessments. We have in our applications for projects to have a complete report of stakeholder consultation. There must be evidence that uh, stakeholders uh, were involved. And this sorry, is sorry, from... Neville. sorry, Neville, can I, can I just interrupt you and just re-emphasize that they have gone a step further than that, and they have insisted on stakeholder engagement, which is yes. at a different level than just the normal consultation. And there's a specific yeah. document within the GCF document to deal with it. Sorry. And, and I think, uh, and I think you know, at the center, that is one thing that uh, we, were, we were concerned about, uh, because this is what the center being an indigenous uh, institution, uh, we are very sensitive about the issue of involving our stakeholders in the whole process from project identification to project articulation to project implementation. Uh, I agree with Steve, they insist on that now. Uh, unfortunately, uh, they don't seem to hold the external donors when they come into the region to the same standards that they hold us. And uh, unfortunately to a lot of our countries prefer to go that route. They feel that they get a, a better deal dealing with uh, the, the old standard institutions than dealing with our own CDB or the, or the center or Canary or whatnot that, from that complex. One of the best projects that we've had in marine protected areas, uh, we went through that whole process. Uh, it ended up basically with the, the, the fisher folk being provide, provided with the boats for patrol, given the authority to patrol. They went out with the signs when they were measuring biomass change over a period. So they became part and parcel of the whole activity. We've learned that without, and I think it also addresses your issue about sustainability. Because if we leave uh, projects basically anchored in stakeholder communities, having built their capacity uh, during the implementation and basically giving them capacity to know what they need to do to maintain it. Uh, I think that's the first step towards uh, uh, sustainability. But it's a very important issue. Thank you very much. Um, Steve, if I may, I also have- No, you have, or... have about five questions there, no, Simon. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> so have... um, Dr. Trotz, based on your extensive experience, especially as a um, as an advisor, um, what is your perspective on integration of young people into um, issues related to climate change? And I am, I mean, this I guess this is a personal question because I am uh early career scientist and i find very um often that it is a very bureaucratic strong arm um sphere there's a lot of um there's a lot of noise a lot of saying oh yeah young people need to step up uh young people need to make the voices heard, but there's also there's also those barriers that prevent this from happening. And and um so what is your perspective? What what do you think uh are the limitations? What do you think are the uh what do you think can be done? And what do you think are some of the um 
positives of this of this reality for young well, the, the, it's not only a reality for uh, for young people it's reality for all Caribbean people who you know aren't part of the uh, of the I, I I don't want to say ruling class but you know what I mean uh, we don't basically seem to uh, understand that when people uh, criticize, uh, is not true vindictiveness, but it's because uh, how something impacts on them, uh, on them personally. Uh, but the young people in the Caribbean uh, have a very important part to play. And one of the encouraging signs is that we have now in the Caribbean a cadre of highly motivated and informed young people. When we look at the uh, opportunities, for instance, under these new, uh, new technologies, uh, business opportunities, it's, it's young people. There's none of the old fogies that you're seeing. Uh, but they, I think, need to uh, organize uh, themselves and be a bit more uh, aggressive. When I say aggressive, I don't mean about pelting stones or anything like that. But making your presence, uh, making your presence uh, felt. And uh, when uh, the university right now churning out some, most of the scientific community uh, that's now contributing to the sciences we know it, are young people uh, who have just come through the, the, the stream. Uh, the other thing is to, I, I, I sense that there's also this, uh, how do I put it? Uh, you need to, for those who have the knowledge, they need to also uh, pull in with them those who don't, but who are suffering. Uh, in other words, a much more broad based uh, youth movement that only doesn't reflect the intellectual capacity of the Caribbean. But get your, your, your young musicians, get your the indigenous, particularly them, they're the critical uh, youth from all different shades of, of society. Uh, I mean, look at what is happening. We we took the lead in the 1.5, but when you see the youth that are posing uh, with this on the, on the international stage, we aren't there. But the scope is there. Uh, it needs leadership. CYEN has been doing uh, an excellent job, uh, but we need more done. I would like to see more young people uh, activists under the climate change uh, on, under the climate change umbrella. It's a voice that can make a difference. And really, you know, you all have much more stake in this than Steve and I, because it's your future that we've been messing around with. It's your world that we have been compromising by inaction. Thank you very, very much. Please, Simone, I'm, I've been monitoring the chat. And again, most of the questions, comments are from you. So if you have a third one that you want to, to, want to shoot at us, or Wesley. Yeah, um, I, 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 I made a remark earlier on, because I think that there are institutions that are there that were designed to encourage a, a high level of participation from all sectors of the regional community. But there are institutions that we have allowed to fall to ruin. And I, I made a comment much earlier on about the, asking the question, where's the Assembly of Caribbean Community Parliamentarians? And that yeah. was a bipartisan institution set up by CARICOM. Yeah. So it, it included a wide cross-section of political players. It's not, it's of course, you have to get the young people involved, but. A, a huge obstacle to a lot of the development um, designs of, of, of our countries. Um, 
become falls prey to, to partisan politics. And the reason why it falls prey to partisan politics is that people see political opportunity. So they oppose when they are out of power and they support fully when they are in power. We were discussing this the other day. So I think that there are institutions that are there, um, the, the, the youth, youth ambassador system and there are other entry points for young people, there, but there are huge entry points. There ought to be a huge, huge entry point for rural communities because you'll find that not all the official representative organizations are truly representative in that way. You usually find um, elite, different kinds of elites based on, mm -hmm. on all kinds of, of, of uh, criteria. Yeah, sorry, Herbert. Thank you. No, thank you. It was more a question, but Neville, you want to you want to make a comment about the parliamentarian group and so? Yes, yes, uh, indeed. Uh, very recently, before I left the center, we had a discussion on this. Uh, let me give you an example of something. We work in the BVI, and for the first, they were the first country to accept the proposal that we put to them. And we actually established a climate change adaptation fund, which was going to be financed through a set of levies on the tourists, arriving tourists, et cetera. Uh, we tried to do this in CARICOM. And the drawback was, no, any more taxes on the uh, tourists, they're not going to come. You know, uh, but I had to point out to them that you're getting a new type of tourist these days, uh, eco-sensitive tourists who are asking questions about your destination. Anyway, uh, to cut a long story short, we got this thing passed through parliament, everything. And it was set to go. And the government changed. <laughs> and do I need to say more? No. So I think one of the errors that we have made is that we have been talking to governments. We need to talk to parliaments. And I think uh, this is a challenge, uh, Wesley, Steve, and those of us who could get something like this going, that we develop a regional crusade, basically where a team goes around the Caribbean to speak to Caribbean parliaments about climate change. Is not a, an issue to have opposition about or anything. We need to be in the same boat uh, with, well, we are in the same boat, uh, but in terms of action, et cetera, uh, we need to buy in to, uh, to, to a policy. We need to buy into to an action program, regardless of who is in power or not, but it is critical. Yeah, Neville, I want to, I want to agree with you and just, just to stick in one, one major point of disagreement that I've, I've, I've found with all the people who keep mentioning about us being in the same boat. We are not in the same boat. We are facing the same rough seas. <laughs> We're not in the same boat. Some of us are comfortably ensconced in our little yachts, you know, and there are some people yeah, on I, And I think, I think that's the real problem there, that because yeah. we recognize that we are not in the same boat, if we really believe we were in the same boat, we'd be bailing together, we'd be rowing together. But there are some people who are riding off these rough seas. I mean, you know, they, they can't tell the difference. They really can't tell the difference. They, they have no idea that there was a COVID interruption for two years, you know? Yeah. They're riding the same rough seas, but they're safely as cons in their, in, their, in their yachts, in their luxury yachts. Whilst you and I, Neville, unlike Wesley, you know, might be paddling there in a, in a little kayak or something. You know, but what I have found as well, mm -hmm. and that, that's why I repudiate this whole is, issue of, of journalists, activist journalists on some of these calls, because there's a lot of selective activism as well. Simone started her presentation by saying social the, climate justice is a human rights question. Yep. So there are people who are selectively focused on one component and not mindful of the fact that, that there is a whole variety, including freedom of expression, including freedom of the press. You know, so those are some of the things. There's another, it's your one. I mean, you, how can you be an activist for environmental management and be an activist against migration, the migration of people? You know, the same person who will hold a banner up saying, let's um, be careful about um, oil pollution 
in, in, the, in the Gulf of Paria would be the same person who hold up, I think, to send them home. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, with respect yeah. to the Venezuelans. You can't have selective activism because there's a lack of credibility and it will undermine the entire process if we have this kind of selective activism. Agreed. I've seen, I've seen Kiran appearing, so I don't know if that is a cue that I should wrap this yeah. session up. Is that, is that what it is, Kiran? Oh, yeah. You're not just nodding at me because you're approved. Okay. All right. So let me try to wrap all of this up by once again thanking, thanking Dr. Trotz for, for his presentation, thanking the audience, the participants, especially through their, through their, their main voice in this session, helps of Simone, to get some of these questions asked and to remind you that if, if we don't answer your question now, the recording comes with the chat recording as well, and we are going to provide answers, those of us who have been directly questioned, or those of us responsible for sessions, in the, in, the, in the chat responses that will be available when the entire package becomes um, more public. So again, let me thank you, Neville. As I said, I, I beg for this opportunity to be the one moderating the session because as I say, I owe you a whole debt of gratitude. And just to put it in context, Simone, if you're worried about, you know, more people mentoring you when you're young, you know, and hard to believe, but I was a young once and, um, you know, and, and, and Neville, Neville helped me. The first was I was older than you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's, that's the point I wanted to make. <laughs> but before you go, Steve, I think I just want to say that Steve was part of a group uh, that designed the first climate change risk management uh framework for the caribbean mm -hmm. and now steve years afterwards we've more or less revisited that and it's an end-to-end -to -end tool apart from identifying risk allows you to delve into a toolbox to quantify that risk so okay. but we you were part of that groundwork okay. so that you know our, our association wasn't totally uh unproductive <laughs> no, no 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 it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't and, and over a soup and bullfrog we will discuss that further <laughs> as a rather 15 year old <laughs> oh, oh no 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 over to you kiran I, this this conversation is way too old for me eh? <laughs> thank you thank you so much gentlemen dr trotz it was really an honor listening to you and um please know that mic is going to be in touch because i think there is a lot more that you could um say to us and that we need to, to shine some light on. So thank you so much for giving of your experience and your knowledge. It was truly, truly appreciated this morning. Steve, thanks for running the session and, um, and for always instilling that lighthearted sense of everything that we do. So I think we're off to um, another, another great start, great ideas. I just want to encourage everyone again to submit your story ideas. There are two email addresses, mediainstitutecaribbean at gmail.com. You can send not just ideas, but any questions that you would like to have answered. And then the story ideas can also be sent to micstoryideas at gmail.com. And as I said, we will be giving small grants and working on stories out of this webinar series to get the ball rolling so that we really create the public groundswell of information and education that we need in order to advance our strategy towards um, accomplishing the climate justice goals for our region. So our next session will be next Tuesday, the 5th of April. As a reminder to everyone, we'd like to start on time. And yes, you will get copies of the presentation and recordings. Those will be sent via email to our attendees this morning. So to all of you, have a wonderful rest of week. And the Media Institute of the Caribbean and Open Society Foundations thanks you for your participation. Have a good day all.